Welcome everybody. Welcome everybody. Welcome everybody. If uh, everybody can take a seat, uh, I will speak in French. Donc, uh, vous avez la traduction. Vous avez. There is interpretation. You should have headphones so you can listen to it. There's interpretation from and into French, German, Italian, and English. Now, stop agoraphobia as the hashtag if you want to tweet. So that's a service announcement. There's a reception afterwards, I'll tell you about that as well. When coming into the room, there's a poster, there's a, a, f a picture we'd like to take at the end of the meeting, so um, you could take one of the posters afterwards when you leave the room, then we could take a picture, and I'll hand the floor to one of the MEPs. Bonjour à toutes et à tous. Good afternoon. Bonjour au président Dina. We're organizing this event together with President Dina. And I'd welcome the president. I'd also welcome the representatives from ECAR who helped us with organizing this. There's also my colleague Jean Lambert sitting in the first row. She together, please stand up, Jean. Please have a round of, can we have a round of applause for Jean Lambert? Hey, mon collègue uh, Philippe. She together with my colleague Philip Lambert, who's not with us today, but will be arriving a bit later. Uh, help me organize this as well. I'm Jean-Jacques Jean Bicep, an MEP, together with my two other colleagues from the Green Group, Philip Lambert and Jean Lambert. I'd like to welcome you warmly to the European Parliament for this public hearing that we are organizing in cooperation with INA and ECAR. Like Marielle de Sarnez, and Madeleine de Grand Maison, I tried in vain du during my legislature and as they did during their legislature to have a resolution, a written resolution adopted by Parliament to recognize colonialism and slavery. I also organized to together with Eva Jolie, another MEP, for the first time in the European Parliament, a, a European week to raise awareness for colonial issues in Europe, slavery, and reparations. And we brought together lawyers, sociologists, and representatives of civil society to discuss these issues and to look at the problem of slavery within Europe and outside of Europe. And we tried to broach the issue of reparations and bring that onto the agenda of international organizations. In October 2013, when we had a conference uh, on people of African descent and black Europeans and the issue of Afrophobia, which I co-organized with uh, INA, was a conference where we also had as a guest Mrs. Diallo, who is here again. We also had a human rights defender from Mauritania who fights against uh, slavery. And we had the entire anti-negrophobia or Afrophobia brigade with us. Now, as you can see, I'm a repeat offender when it comes to protecting our rights, and I will continue to protect our, protect our rights. Deputy Afro -descendant. Now, I'm a, an MEP of African descent. I'm a descendant of slaves. And to this date, uh, I am the only one in my position who's a, a, an elected member of this parliament. And I think that gives me a great responsibility. Now, today we will be discussing Afrophobia, and when we say that, what do we mean? Well, phobia, the suffix uh, phobia, is used in technical jargon in psychiatry to 
describe irrational fear that people might have and this as a result uh, of psychiatric troubles that one has. So Afrophobia means irrational fear that people have of people of African descent which leads to the exclusion of uh, black uh, people and them being ignored. Now racism in general and racism against people of African descent in particular is a problem which is on the rise and unfortunately this leads to scenes where if black football players take to the field they have to listen to monkey chants and that is outrageous now of course the European uh, Parliament uh, wants to make a stance on that uh, and in Italy what we saw is that the first black minister that was uh, uh, voted in was also uh, receiving monkey chants in the Italian government and unfortunately there are many examples of this there's a Ministry of Justice in France who has been the subject of racist abuse on a number of occasions and they've even thrown a banana uh, at her when she was travelling. Now, I'm the only uh, elected member of this house of African descent and we don't want to continue to accept this political destabilisation and I don't uh, want people to try and remove me from the political landscape in France. Now, to look at these issues, we have organised three panel discussions, and we'll move on to those in a minute. But please allow me to apologise. I'm sure that you know about I events in Italy and the fact that the government there has tendered its res resignation. So the first Italian black minister was to be with us, but she couldn't travel here because she had to be in Italy to deal with events there but she did send us a message saying that she's fighting the same fight as we are because she herself uh, is uh, also a victim of these issues that we are trying to raise awareness about but I would suggest that we open the first panel Oui, euh, je vais d'abord passer le, la parole au, au vice-président. But before opening the first panel, I'll give the vice chair of INA the floor, Mr. Jallo Mamoudou. Please go ahead, sir. Thank you very much, um, Mr. John Bishop. Um, on behalf of the European Network Against Racism, uh, I would like to um, say welcome to all of you to this um, groundbreaking um, hearing on Afrophobia here today at the European Parliament. As you know already, the objective of this event is to raise awareness and concern about how people of African descent and black Europeans are specifically targeted by Afrophobia, racism, and stereotypes and to emphasize the urgency with which this specific form of racism must be recognized. That's the main reason why we are here today, because there's an urgent need to recognize this specific type of racism that black people face. Rather than talk about racism in general terms and exclude this particular group as it has been done in centuries. On the one hand, we have proudly professed within the United, uh, European Union the great principle of democracy. But yet people of African descent and black Europeans on a daily basis are confronted by the very opposite of those principles. But now more than ever before, it's the time for the European Union and our political representatives to acknowledge and face up to the challenges black people are confronted with in every part of this union. For the shape of the political demography today does not afford us the luxury of an apartheid system in which special groups are treated differently just because of how they look or because of their origin. A system in which people are excluded not because of their ability to contribute, but rather because of structures that are motivated by the most extreme form of racism. 
Afrophobia. Our presence here today is a clear manifestation of the urgent need for concern and recognition for the continued exclusion of black people in Europe. And for us black people, we do not seek to solve this problem just because it's the European Parliament election ahead, but rather because it is a manifestation of the basic principles of democracy upon which we claim our nation states are built. For us black people, we do not seek to solve this problem merely because we think this is a question of integration, but rather because it is a manifestation of the basic and fundamental human rights. We cannot claim to be living in societies that are made up of principles of democracy and yet practice the very opposite of those principles. And for us black people, we are saying in no uncertain terms, just like so many people before us have said, that racism and Afrophobia must stop now. For us black people, we do not only have to face the violent realities of the racist structures every day, but also the appalling silence of the good people, the silence of people in power that we face every single day. So I therefore believe that we as members of society and elected officials, especially here at the European Parliament, bear the responsibility for our stand in history, for as such will we be viewed in history. The European Network Against Racism is advocating for an EU-wide framework of action for people of African descent and black Europeans. And we need to take that seriously because we don't, we're running out of time. And on behalf of ENA, as I mentioned earlier on, I welcome you all to this hearing on Afrophobia today and hope that we will all take a stand, a clear stand against Afrophobia by the end of this day. Welcome to the hearing on Afrophobia. Thank you. Thank you. Maintenant, nous allons passer au premier panel. We will now move on to the first panel. I'll give the floor to the moderator, the director of INA, Mr. Mikhail Privo. So you can give us the lead into the first panel and you can tell us who the panelists are. Merci beaucoup, Jean Jacob. Uh, bon Thank you very much, Jean Jacob. Well, welcome to all of you. Good afternoon. Ladies and gentlemen, we're very happy to welcome you uh, here today. Let me, organize, let me thank the Greens again for organizing this ev uh, event and in particular Jean-Jacques Jean Jacob for putting this on the European agenda and for his unwavering support for this cause. Now this session of course is important for a number of reasons. Uh, first of all, it, it puts the issue of phenotype and of color on the agenda when it comes to the distribution of power, distribution of wealth, and when it comes to our fight against inequalities. So that makes it an eminently political issue. Secondly, it is important because within the political world, it's starting to metabolize, as it were, which means that this area is now being taken into account, it's being recognized, and we can finally move on to a political dialogue uh, about the measures to be taken and how to resolve these issues. And we certainly hope that the European Parliament can continue I its work on this uh, when the new Parliament has been elected. Now, you're sending out a clear political signal today uh, by your presence. This is important. You're not just pay paying lip service to the issue, and it's something that you will continue to fight for. And uh, within INAR, with all of our colleagues, we'll make sure that this is on the agenda of the next legislature in Parliament as well. I'll give the floor to Philomena Ased in a minute, our first speaker, our first panelist. The panel seeks to set things in the, its historical context first, before we then move on to actions and how to mobilize uh, people, which is the other panels. Now, I'll switch to English because I'm not sure how I'll translate it in French. I won't, I'm not even going to try. Leadership studies at Antioch uh, University in the United States, and she's also an affiliated researcher uh, for Utrecht University graduate gender program. 
And she will focus now on introducing the broader topic uh, based on her article that will be published hopefully by the end of the year in a new publication of INAR and called a brief ABC of, of Black Europe, where she focuses on the consequences of the lack of recognition of past abuses uh, on people of African descent and black European lives and so forth. And so she will have the floor for about 12 minutes, very sharp, so that Thank we you. can have a small conversation afterwards with the, with the audience. So Philomena, you have the floor. Thank you very much. It's uh, a great honor to be here, and I'll try to keep to the 12 uh, minutes. Um, first of all, I want to say something about um, being here very briefly. It's my second time that I uh, speak to the, uh, in the building of the European Parliament. The first time was, I think, in 1986 or something, um, and there were members of Parliament, and some were reading the newspapers, etc. and I thought, what is this? But this looks much better, and I'm <laughs> glad to have a second opportunity. Um, first, I want to say something about the, the category or the label of um, people of Afro-descent. Afro um, people of Afro-descent uh, in Europe live in communities of national and ethnic origin, while others um, uh, do not. Uh, form racial communities, they might live dispersed throughout the country of residence and have been assimilated culturally into white communities. There are significant numbers of culturally assim assimilated middle class Afro descendants in Northwestern Europe, but um, Afro descendants are also overrepresented among the European poor and marginalized. So people of Afro descent in Europe are heterogeneous and often unconnected across countries. This might be one way of connecting, which is very good. Many share only some uh, phenotypical or, if you wish, racial resemblances. Probably the only common European experience among many, if not all, Afro descendants is their exposure to racism and systemic discrimination, regardless of country, social economic conditions, gender, age, or level of education. Now let me now extend in more detail on the common experience of anti-black uh, racism. Am I speaking too fast? Okay, good. I can go faster. Um, <laughs> anti-black racism is a systemic and it is institutionalized. It's rooted in the formation of European culture and identity as world powers in the course of centuries. I will talk about anti-black racism in relation to the memory of slavery and colonialism, I will talk about the, nation, the notion of entitlement racism, which is another notion that I'm introducing in the field. And um, it's the sense that whites feel entitled to humiliate African uh, descendants. And I will talk about the denial of racism and about racism against women of African descent. First, in relation to slavery. It's significant to know that in contrast to the US, slave plantation systems were established outside of Europe and in the Caribbean and South American territories. I've been asked from time to time to make comparisons with the US because I live in the US and folks thought that that might be helpful. Um, the silencing of slavery in, um, uh, in the national consciousness in Europe has led to disconnection in the European mind between current anti-black racism and histories of colonialism and enslavement. In the US, knowledge about slavery and resistance has been transmitted from one African-American gener generation to another. This is not generally the case among Afro-descendants in Europe. The enslavement of Africans brought enormous wealth to Europe. Portugal, Spain, the Netherlands, Britain, France were among the major slave trading countries. Countries such as Germany and Sweden have yet to come out of the closet as profiteers of the slave trade. Increasingly, activists and organizations across Europe are demanding that states apologize for the injustices of slavery. The French originated the European Memorial Foundation for Slave Trade and successfully pressed for the French law declaring slave trade and sl slavery a crime against humanity. Other countries are starting to integrate slavery into national histories. For instance, the Netherlands now has a slave monument in, uh, uh, placed. But they stay clear from offering compensation. Okay, the relation to uh, of racism to colonialism. For many people of Afro-descent, the historical context of reference and, uh, are colonialism and post-colonialism rather than slavery, even when they might be descendants of enslaved people from the Caribbean uh, or South Amer American backgrounds. This is different than the US, where the, the direct reference to the slavery experience is the dominant framework to refer to blacks. 
different than the U.S., colonialism, including slavery, its economic, social, and psychological implications and consequences are largely ignored in European canons. Colonial relations continue to exist, including the inequalities involved. So the consequences of colonialism have not been dealt with in Europe. This holds true for the dependency mentality, which means passivity and a sense of powerlessness among the formerly colonized, as well as for remnants of the European colonial mentality, meaning paternalism and the creation of second-class citizens. Now I turn, so I just take sections because I only have brief, uh, a brief time. Now I want to say something about the denial, more about the denial of racism and its consequences. Due to the public taboo on mentioning racism and emotional, if not aggressive, response to accusations of racism from the side of white Europeans, many Afro-descendants are neither aware of racism nor sufficiently equipped to resist. Frequently, those exposed to racism experience a sense of powerlessness in the face of accusations that they are just oversensitive. So basically, the situation you get is that there's no racism, just all these oversensitive uh, black people. Systemic exposure to racial discrimination in all sectors of society, from housing and education to labor market and parliamentary debates, is stressful. It can take a toll on the health and the mental health of victims. Whether or not directly related, there are indications in the UK and in the Netherlands, and probably in other countries, but I don't have the, the numbers there, that disproportionate numbers of people of Afro descent are diagnosed with schizophrenia. It remains unclear, uh, the suggestion is, but it remains unclear whether this is a result of racism or whether it is misdiagnosis or whether it is an increase in mental health problems um, uh, due to the stressful conditions in which people live. So, Basically, the impact of everyday racism on the lives of Afro-descendants continues to be a neglected issue among European policymakers. Now let me move to what I've called entitlement racism, uh, the blatant anti-black racism in the name of freedom. During the final two decades of the previous century, many researchers of racism, including myself, found that um, racism had become more subtle and more difficult to pinpoint in Western countries. I have reason to believe that the subtleness thesis needs to be revisited. There are too many instances of blatant racism against black Europeans where, Europe, where people can be presumed to be perfectly aware of the offensive implications of actions, wordings, and statements, in particularly among political, cultural, and media elites. In the Netherlands, Sweden, and other Scandinavian countries, the local term for, uh, for Negro is still being used like that term. In those countries, it's translated often as neger. It's still commonly used to refer to dark-skinned people of African descent. Only recently, after years of protest, has the main Dutch dic dictionary included a qualification that some people might take offense to that word as derogatory. Now, um, the new millennium sees a moral rejection of racism as something that is losing ground. Increasingly, the argument of freedom in or is used in order to defend racist comments. I have coined this entitlement racism, the which means claiming the right to racially offend in the name of freedom. There are many examples where people of African descent in Europe are humiliated, from football players to members of parliament and the occasional minister. There is evidence of old-fashioned race hierarchical thinking where black people are uh, compared to monkeys and so on. Each and every EU, EU country has its own examples. The good news is, is that Afro-Europeans are becoming more assertive and protest, often through the social media. Social media indeed are a very important tool of protest. Um, the, the, the particular uh, form of, um, of racism denial I will address in a book, uh, that my latest book that is being launched tomorrow. It's called Dutch Racism, so look out for it. Um, it's the, the, the denial of racism is one part that is um, uh, speci not specific for the Netherlands, but very much part of Dutch racism. It's co if you compare that to the US, we can, ha we can see the following. Advocates of the opinion 
in the Netherlands also often and by other parts of Europe is that we have be moved beyond racism, might be riding the waves of color blindness these days in the US. An important difference is, however, that the US acknowledged systemic racism while still struggling with the contradictions between individual black achievement and the humiliating conditions of many black lives. Communities and critical scholars have developed strong and alert voices to intervene against racism. Moreover, even while white racism remains insidious and widespread in the US, different from Europe, there is a general sense that people should not get away with it. <coughs> Moral erosion in general, and in particular with respect to offensively racist language, did not come out of the blue. It goes together with a tough language of neoliberalism, foregrounding individual accountability and personal choice rather than systems of privilege and disadvantage. In the US, the election of a black president has reinforced the myth that race is not a factor of disadvantage anymore. This opened doors to hate language and racist blacklash, black sh uh, like black should stop blaming whites. We are tired of being accused of racism. Uh, and so on, and that, that the, the, the backlash seems to have no limits. Typical for the US compared to Europe is that racism in, is, uh, uh, is that African Americans have a long history of open protest and that there is generally more sophisticated understanding of anti-black racism. People can lose their jobs over racist comments, in particular high profile people. I still have to see that happen in Europe. In Europe, everything seems possible. Finally, I want to say something about racism against women. Races, race is not a gender neutral concept. Perceptions of Afro-descendants, men and women, are shaped by many factors, including histories of colonialism, like uh, think of the white males and the nature of mitresses, imagined exoticism, the idea of the black women, the female warm sensuality, very active uh, sexuality. I'm talking about imagination, right? Um, Against that background, one has to look at the sex trade and abuse of African women that has been reported on, among others, in Belgium. In the Netherlands, where uh, prostitution is legal, women of Afro-descent end up in the lowest paid and most risky sectors of sex work. Beauty norms are another, are another gender issue. Little is known in Europe about the impact of the white beauty norm on women of Afro-descent. Skin bleaching and, uh, uh, and as a response to exclusion on the basis of race can be found among others, uh, uh, among women of Ghanaian background in Europe. This relates to the pathologizing of the black body uh, as a sexual object, as uh, animalistic, and so on, and of black culture as primitive and uncivilized. Which Many examples of these are, uh, can be found. I will conclude with, by saying something about the race contradiction. Um, racism is often denied in Europe with the argument that there is no race, or we don't even have the word race in our dictionary, but like there is no race, so there can be no racism. But race does not translate explicitly into, in, 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 in policy making. At the same time, Race is in the legal category in the European law. So what's happening over here? Either you have race or you don't. If you don't have race, you don't need to have it, uh, the, the law against race discrimination. Finally, um, a, 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 a thought about uh, the, the need, the, the word of Afrophobia. Um, I hope it's not going to be used as, to, as a word to replace racism because Afrophobia refers to psychological dimensions and it can make ra racism uh, a ahistorical concept disconnected from relations of power, which is what it is about. So it's not only about fear or about hostility, but profoundly also about contempt, humiliation, um, and unprocessed colonial paternalism, the pathologizing of Africa, and the continuing um, uh, uh, oppression of people of African descent. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lomena. That was really brilliant and with lots of content. So I, I, will, uh, I think that everybody's kind of now digesting all the information that was provided so generously <laughs> from your side. Um, yes, you have been opening many, many uh, different issues. And I guess that during the, the, the short debate that we're going to get, you might touch and go a bit further into that. Uh, I'm, je vais donner le, la parole maintenant à...
I'll now give the floor to Louis Georgetin. He's a French activist who's been involved in the fight against homophobia and racism for many years. He was uh, elected chair of Cran in uh, November 2011. He's a former student of the École Normale Supérieure and has a doctorate in literature. He's going to focus on the history of France and the need for that country to acknowledge this and uh, to pay some kind of reparation. Ten minutes. Well, can I negotiate 12, says the speaker. Well, politics about negotiating, isn't it? Thanks very much, uh, Jean Jacob, and thanks one and all for your kind invitation. In talking about Afrophobia, we're talking about relations between Europe and Africa. The relations have existed for centuries. Now, this history has been characterized by colonialism. There are three different phases, the end of the 15th century to the end of the 19th century, which was about slavery. The second phase from the uh, uh, beginning of the 20th century to the 60s, where there was also slavery, but uh, not by the same name, forced labor. Let me give you the example of France. At the beginning of colonialism, the French had about 1.5 million slaves, but slavery was, was replaced by forced labor. It wasn't all that different from slavery. And uh, France recruited six to eight million locals for forced labor without pay, which is the same as slavery after all, with mortality rates that were comparable to slavery. So the second phase was forced labor, in other words, slavery by another name. And the third period began after the independence of African countries. There, there was neo-colonialism and uh, the pillaging of the resources of Africa. Now, I'd like to look at slavery and uh, the paying of some kind of compensation. Now, this is just a synonym for justice. If you go to a court to get compensation, comp it's about justice. Now, let's consider the impact of uh, colonialism, particularly the first phase, slavery. First of all, let's, the impact on demographics. European historians reckon that the number of people deported in the first colonial period is between 12 and 15 million. It could be higher in all likelihood, but let's accept that span. But what's forgotten is the number of Africans who died on the continent fighting to prevent being captured and to protect their families. Usually, to get one slave, four people had to be killed. It was uh, the uh, slave traders themselves that said that, so they probably knew what they were talking about. So uh, at the end of the day, all the people who died fighting against the slavers, uh, they're victims too. If it's a, a one to four relation to, uh, relationship, then we're talking uh, a massive figure. Then there were people who were were recruited for forced labor, six to eight million in France, but of course the other colonial powers used that, the, the British, the Spaniards, and so forth. We need some figures for that. So if you tot all these figures up, you end up with colossal figures. France is the country on the be best. Uh, slavery didn't, be, uh, didn't end in 1848. It was only until uh, 1946 that it finally uh, stopped in the initial colonial period. There was 1.5 million slaves to 6.8, running up to 1946. The League of Nations at the time condemned France. Call that forced labor if you like, but the fact of the matter is it's slavery and that it is in breach of international law, European law, and indeed French law. So that's the demographic impact, enough said. Now, what about the political impact? The political structures that existed in Africa, empires, chiefdoms, kingdoms, all these political structures were weakened, fragmented, or destroyed 
which of course made it all the easier to colonialize uh, these areas. Um, I, I'm jumping over five years of uh, history in a somewhat cavalier fashion. I apologize. What about the economic impact? I hate the expression human resources, but there's also material resources. They were pillaged and looted, and that continues. That didn't stop in 1960, continues today. Multinationals are active in Africa and elsewhere. But we're talking about Afrophobia, and uh, this looting has had disastrous consequences because it's not the Africans who benefit uh, from their resources. It's not Europeans either, for that matter. It, so who profits from it, one may well ask. Then there's a cultural impact. Th that's very substantial. Racism is one of the first Im uh, consequences of racism. Racism didn't always exist in Europe. It's a sort of a byproduct of colonialism. If you go and colonialize or enslave people, you need to justify it. And these racist theories were drawn up uh, uh, on the basis of pseudo-scientific or pseudo-religious reasons. So racism is a direct consequence of colonialism. And it was sort of uh, a vicious circle of uh, cause-effect, effect-cause. Colonialism came about. People wanted to enrich themselves and take on the resources. So, so, so racism created destruction of languages, religions, identities. I, I'm skipping just over these. What about the environmental impact of colonialism? Well, it's quite uh, dramatic. A lot of uh, environmentalists here in the room, so I won't pretend to know more than you do. But uh, nonetheless, I do draw this to your attention. Now, the fight for compensation. Now, that's not something that has come from Mars. It's as old as colonialization itself. What did colonialized people ask for? Well, freedom and justice. Not just one thing, two. Okay, freedom has been obtained uh, by force and tails, but justice has yet to come. But th these two points are fundamental. And these have been called for and demanded right from the outset. If you look back, in time, we have uh, witnesses from way back, people who, who were deported to Barbados, Brazil, or the United States, said, I want to go back home. I lived in that's such a region of Africa. This was the origin of the Back to Africa movement, after all. It was about compensation. And they also say, I enriched this land through my sweat, blood, and toil. So what about agrarian reform? Others uh, said, well, I'm old. Uh, and uh, infirm, and I want some kind of pension. Others still said, I'm still young, I could study, but I need some kind of scholarship or bursary. So different demands depending on different situations. Others said, I would like tribute to, to be paid to those that came before me, my ancestors. I want people to remember what happened. So all these things we can call for today are as old as colonialization and slavery itself. We've not invented anything new. This is an old struggle, and we've got texts from, from people of all colors who've mobilized for this. Gondorcy, Martin Luther King, and uh, any numbers of, of, of writers, Wally Salinka, and uh, very many writers who have mobilized for uh, compensation. Kelly House is worth mentioning. So what I'm trying to say is, is that this is an old struggle. When uh, slavery was abolished in the USA, th there, there was compensation, which was uh, swiftly uh, overturned after uh, Lincoln's murder. Uh, there were laws voted by both houses, but, but President Johnson vetoed them. He was very, he came after Lincoln. So there was some kind of compensation in the USA, but the impact was pretty limited. Likewise, in Europe, there was uh, legislation for compensation, but it was uh, for the benefit of the those that uh, got wealthy from slavery in France, the UK, and the Netherlands. There were very uh, 
substantial payments to slavers because they came out winners. They were richer after the abolition of slavery. So uh, they did pretty nicely. The most symbolic or tragic case is Haiti. You know that that uh, Santo Domingo became Haiti. C compensation was paid to the former. It was, but it was paid by, to the former colonialists by the slaves. Attempt. They had to pay twenty billions of today's money, which they paid up to nineteen forty-six, basically to pay off the debt that uh, French had imposed on Haiti, which uh, led the island into the vicious circle of poverty and political instability with which we are all too familiar. So that's a brief overview I wanted to give you. Now, what's the state of play today? This is an international struggle. You know that the African Union has been addressing this issue for some time, and we work very closely with them. Uh, so we've been wor working on this issue. It was uh, debated in uh, Durban in 2001. CARICOM adopted a position in favour of compensation, and they are developing dossiers which are going to be sent to the UK, France, and Netherlands. So this is something they should put in the agenda of NR. The UK recently played, uh, paid reparations to Kenya, and more is to follow. I think it's worth discussing this. Now, what, what, what's reparations? What's compensation? Well, it's, it, it's a principle of any kind of justice. There can be no crime without justice, uh, at least in a democracy. At least that's what I, what I was taught. It, just because a crime is the worst, it shouldn't be. There shouldn't be less justice, and I think this has been overlooked in the case of slavery and colonization. If you're saying, "Well, compensation is not possible," then you then you're arguing in favor of, uh, that this is a perfect crime. It's more than a perfect crime, because the people who received reparations were the criminals, not the victims, and the, uh, those that argue in favor of the impunity of criminals are in a bit of a problem because crimes against humanity will have become perfect crimes. Those that perpetrated the crime uh, have uh, been followed by those that uh, allow impunity. But crimes against humanity do not lapse. Slavery was deemed to be a crime against humanity in Durban. So we can't deny that there is a need for reparations. The question is, how? What kind of modalities? And here we can look at what's been proposed for some time, agrarian reform, museums, education. A number of ideas have been suggested by numerous associations. I won't detail possible measures, but companies and companies that were responsible for crimes against humanity are accountable. And that is a principle of international justice and international security. But if we're going to start saying, well, the crimes of yesterday can be got, to, got away with, that there is impunity, then criminals today will know that tomorrow they can enjoy impunity and they will get away with it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That was an uh, impressive performance in every regard. I learned a lot. And it's definitely food for thought for NR and uh, participants today. It was a very interesting take on it. Uh, now I'll give the floor to our last speaker, Virginie Sassoon, a doctor of information sciences. She's an associate expert in the Vanos uh, Europe Institute. She's, a, she, she's in charge of a project called Media Citizenship and Diversity. And she's going to tell us about how the media in Europe uh, portrays black people and what impact it has on the people themselves. Good afternoon. Thank you. The representation of black people in Europe in 12 minutes, that's quite a challenge. 
So I'll just try to give you some key points that might help you understand the broad trends. The media have a very special responsibility in promoting social cohesion. They are, if you will, a sounding box for societal problems. And by high, uh, creating a hierarchy of information, they condition the way in which we tackle different issues, be they economic, political, or social. And of course, they condition our relations with each other. So media build borders between ourselves, the invisible majority and the visible minority, and are part and parcel of the creation of an other deemed to be foreign and or inferior. Now in Europe, contrary to the USA, black people are often seen as being external, outside the international community as imagined. Now Africans are uh, victims of are, are victims of racism, but they're not seen as foreigners. But in Europe, they are seen as foreigners. Now, visibility in the media has been crucial for a social struggle in Europe. There aren't re really coordinated uh, uh, European policies on the representation of minorities, and there, there are massive differences between countries on this front. The presence of black people in the media is the product of migration, of colonialism, or there are political models of integration in, in inverted commas, and of course there are media laws on the books. Now on this slide, I'd like to talk about the question of uh, visibility, which is part of the social struggle. I'd like to show you and illustrate the differences that exist between European countries. Here, the difference between the UK and France. In France in 2006, uh, Harry Rosal Mack uh, became the presenter for the news broadcast on TF1. That was a milestone. That selfsame year, Trevor MacDonald, born in Trinidad, retired. That shows you the difference in terms of visibility in the UK and France. A generation, basically. Now, this is because as of the 50s, the audiovisual industry in Britain committed to representing the whole of society. That only happened much later in France. D'accord, je vais ralentir alors. I'll try and slow down. Yes, uh, the interpreters do appreciate that. Je vais parler plus doucement, mais 12 minutes, ça me... <laughs> ça, ça me... 12 minutes, uh, does gener uh, 12 minutes uh, time limit does generate a bit of stress, though. Donc je reprends. So, back to Harry Rizalmack and Trevor McDonald, two journalists who present the evening news in a big commercial broadcaster, a generational difference. One arrives when the other one's retiring, and that illustrates the differences between the policies in the audiovisual field in the UK and France. The Brits took measures of a clear and tangible nature to fight against discrimination. Ofcom, the uh, regulator in Britain, can carry out a qualitative and quantitative uh, assessment of public service broadcasting. The BBC has a diversity centre that is in charge of seeing to the anti-discrimination legislation is complied with. And there's a council of black journalists within the National Union of Journalists. However, in France in 2009, there's a diversity barometer which measures the representation of non-whites in the media, but there's no ethnic statistics, so it's hard to say what this measures because you can't uh, compare it uh, with the reality of uh, the composition of French society. Black associations find it difficult to, to uh, be represented in the media because it's seen as being too community-oriented and implying fragmentation. Northern Europe, in broad brushstrokes, is uh, further ahead in anti-discrimination and in terms of uh, anti-discrimination measures. 
And this has an impact on the way that um, black people are represented in the media in these countries. Over and above visibility, I think we have to ask about the nature and quality of the content black people appear in. Black people are overrepresented in sport. This sort of reduces black people to, in, to bodies in the collective imagination. To recurrent uh, figures are criminals, uh, black people as dangerous savages. Or that's one cliche. Another stereotype is migrants. So again, the other, foreigners, when black people are mentioned in news stories, it's, it ties in with uh, security issues, crime, riots, or in situations of poverty or homelessness. We see biological racism still alive and well in Europe. We thought it disappeared. De Minute is a far-right uh, publication in France. On its uh, cover, it had Christian Taubira, uh, represented uh, as a monkey. Taubira finds his banana again. And then on the other one, you go, you see a cartoon of Mario Balotelli, the football player, who is compared with King Kong and other simians. So black people as apes. Yeah. And examples can be found of this throughout Europe. Now I'd like to talk about the representations of beauty. That's very important. The aesthetic argument is uh, often part and parcel of racist theories. In the 19th century, scientific racism systematic associated black people with ugliness, um, this and all their features, their hair, their lips, their nose, and so forth. That's uh, reflected in, in advertising where black people have been caricatured since the 19th century. Black people were often used to sell products that referred to their skin color, chocolate, coffee, or to contrast white products such as detergent, rice, flour, and still that happens today. Now, advertising is part of media discourse and does play a, a strong prescriptive role, particularly for young people. Today, black uh, people, particularly women with dark skin, are used in advertising to sell exotic products from Africa or the Caribbean. So that's colonialism, rum, chocolate, that's the kind of thing they use to market. Here's two examples of advertising. These w were widespread throughout Europe. Ne sexism and racism clearly linked here. Body and product are fused together. And then the other one, the human body d disappears and, it, and is suggested by bars of chocolate, uh, which uh, of course represents a set of buttocks. Here's an ad campaign from the UK. Move on, uh, Nomi. There's a new diva in town, also a brand of chocolate. Nomi Ca Campbell uh, took them to court. Again, we're seeing here the association between a person and a product. Another dimension that we see in uh, advertising's representation of male and female black bodies. Um, uh, this is uh, women's bodies. This is uh, the body equaling an animal. This is uh, says, do not feel the animal. 
And you, and you see the picture there of a famous model. Photograph this is another photograph of Naomi Campbell, which once again gives an example of uh, the black body being close to nature, being part of nature. So here, here's it's their animal dimension that is being highlighted. And that again suggests that they are outside or beyond civilization. In the world of fashion, there are uh, there's an overrepresentation of black women. In the color of beauty, a film which was uh, came out twenty ten. Basically, the models that succeed look like white people uh, that are black. They have white feature, uh, features. So that was read out very quickly. So the interpreter apologizes. So again, this consumption of beauty is uh, something that other magazines have emulated. Here you've got an example of Vogue and another one of Numero. White women painted black one to represent an African queen. It's hard to, to understand why they, they have uh, made white people uh, as black, but ag again, it's um, it's a manifestation of the fact that beauty is white, uh, and of course, the big reminder that is blackface, where this uh, in the days of segregation, when white people blacked up. Though, f fortunately, such spectacles disappeared in the sixties with the civil rights movement. Pour représenter rapidement uh, la now, beauty and uh, normative concepts of that. Uh, here I mentioned uh, L'Oreal. They're involved in ethnic cosmetics. Uh, here you see an example of how they conceive diversity. It, it, it's pretty low grade diversity. They prefer. Uh, women that are mixed race, rather that than anything else. Here they were accused of have, having whitened the skin of uh, Beyoncé, and here she's uh, also had her hair bleached. Again, uh, this is uh, a lack of color blindness in uh, advertising. There's a kind of hierarchy of skin colors in advertising and a hierarchy of beauty, which of course is directly linked to social hierarchy. And I'll crack on and conclude with an ad campaign from 2011. Here you see a black man who's uh, shaved. Uh, his head and beard, and it says, re civilize yourself. So you get the message, sorry, I had to skate over this. I'd like to have gone into these images in a bit more depth. I think they really did, they really did deserve uh, more in depth uh, discussion. But I w do want to conclude that these representations, these stereotypes, be they conscious or not, reveal. The, that certain ways of thinking continue uh, alive and well. That a product uh, of uh, racism, and I think uh, in at the end of the day, you've got to allow more black people to involved in uh, positions of responsibility in publicity and in all areas. And again, training and recruitment are crucial. They're crucial levers so that those that manufacture the media are, are genuine reflections of the societies they themselves are supposed to reflect. Thank you. Thank you, Virginie. You didn't have a lot of time, but I think you managed to get your message across very clearly. Now, 
if people want to know more about your research, in October 2013, you did publish about uh, your work, and I think people can always use that uh, as a reference reading. We'll put that on the INA website. Now, we have 13 minutes left during this panel to engage with you, the audience. We'll take two or three questions, and that way our panelists can also react to that. Now, first come, first served, I'm afraid. Please tell me what your name is, which organization you represent. I can see some hands going up. Excellent. And please also let us know whether your question is for one of the panelists in particular or for all three of them. So the gentleman here, the lady here, and then the la gentleman at the back. One more, the lady here. There we go. And if we have time for a second round, we'll have a second round. Thank you. Thank you very much. My name is Colin Sweke. I'm um, a councillor in uh, Austin City Council. And uh, I'm also um, a candidate uh, for election into the European uh, Parliament in May. Um, I um, want to commend the, um, the lady to, um, to your right, I suppose, uh, who made um, a very, very impressive um, uh, presentation. And I'm going to quote from what um, she said to us. And after the quote, I'm going to... Um, ask uh, John Jacob to uh, give us um, a response. She said, and I quote, people in the US can lose their jobs for racist comments, especially high profile persons, but not in Europe, unquote. When can we see this beginning to happen in Europe, especially driven by the European Union? John Jacob, thank you. We'll take all of the questions and then after that we'll have the answers. Alors j'avais Madame ici. Yes, the lady here. Merci Jean Pierre. Thank you Jean Pierre. The network of migrant women and the Belgian network of migrant women too. Um, first is for you, Dr. Esed. Thank you for the presentation, and I'll go. Maybe in the same line as uh, Mr. Just, uh, just said, go back to the denial and uh, what you raised about uh, the psychological aspect of Afrophobia, <laughs> if we can call it so, because this is not only taboo within the Afro community, but in the, the perpetrators, I would say. And uh, this is really, really key because I think there's uh, some more research to be done on that, at least in trying to identify what might be the societal factors that leads to that. And here in Belgium, we see more and we, I, I, I mean, I see more and more in the people that I get to meet that something is happening in that uh, area in the psychological uh, thing and uh, coming to Mrs. Uh, Sassoon, I'll phrase it in French so that uh, maybe you can share how you will respond to that because I think media has a big responsibility in it and uh, to change this we really need to get people being professional within the communication field but I don't think only at top level, it's at executive level because the head of a redaction doesn't always uh, write, take images, the designer is not him, it's the people that do the job that, that give this. He's giving the, 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 the go thing. And to what Mr. said about election, I think for us, Afro-descent people, it is all also in AU for those who have the electoral right to challenge the parties and say this has to be in your party agenda next time, full stop. Merci beaucoup. C'était clair. Thank you very much. That was very clear. The third question was the gentleman at the end. Hello. Hello. Yes. Um, good afternoon. First of all, uh, mm -hmm. I would like to compliment the members of the panel. My name is Alden van Genderen. I'm a representative of the Organization of American States based in Europe. 
and uh, the question I would like to pose is the following. And you can, maybe you have, uh, you, you can hear already that English is not my language. Due to colonialism, my language is Dutch, my formal language. And my question is that, yes, I fully agree with your battle uh, for uh, compensation. That is a good legal fight. But I think we need to do more than that. It is uh, not only a legal fight. And having said that, my question to you is, what is your view on to influence the educational sector here in Europe, especially to influence the curricula of higher education institutions, because my white brothers and white sisters don't know much about the history. And when we talk about that, they always deny that. So what can we do as a group and you as European Parliament to influence the educational system here in Brussels, Belgium, and the other European member states? Thank you so much. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. And the last question was for the lady here. Yeah. Micro. Bonjour. En fait. Good afternoon. I don't really have any questions to put, but I would like to tell you about two pieces of information which might be of interest to you all. Let me start off by saying that I uh, am of. Brazilian nationality and I'm part of a UNESCO project together with my organization. Now first of all we have a, an exposition, an exhibition on slavery as part of our project. Now we're trying to find a, a place to put a monument so that everyone can see that. The second piece of information is that the UN has declared the decennia, the, the decade uh, of Afro descent from 2015 to 2025, and nobody talks about it, so I thought I'd tell you. Alors à nos différents panélistes. Thank you very much. We'll now give the floor to the various panelists. Shall we start with you, Philomena? Um. I thought I needed this, but this is what I need. Um, you asked um, um, a lady over there about the psychological aspects uh, of racism. Um, I think what, what ha has been done in the U.S., um, not, not completely and not fully, uh, but where they have a head start and what we have not done in Europe, oh, okay, um, is that um, um, the history, a, a, a legacy of colonialism has psychological consequences. People have been hurt from generation over generation. And that is something that um, we should not repress, but we should um, embrace as part of what makes uh, people, us, Afro-descendants, but also how to heal from that. And that is something that has to be taken seriously. And that is uh, something that uh, one has to do within the community. The other side of it, uh, part of that is uh, learning not to be silenced by, um, by aggressive response to racism. And this is not to say um, um, if you remain silent, you're bad. Um, it is just to say that um, speaking up and giving voice and not accepting is the only way forward. And people will uh, discover their own time and space when they can do that. That is one part of it. The other part of the psychology is that if there is no voice or not sufficient voice against racism, the other side continues to believe that it is okay. So that is part of that. And, and, and it has gone to the point in Europe where, where I came with this notion of entitlement racism that it is now perceived, and there are many examples. I don't have the time, but they are all over the place, examples that have been in the media as well, where people feel it's my right, it's I have the, the, the right of freedom of expression. And um, I don't take freedom of expression light. It is something that people have died for. Blood has been shed over the freedom of expression. So one has to uh, treasure that. But I think once you have that right, the issue is not how I'm going to claim that right. The issue is how I am going to be responsible, how to use my voice in a responsible way. Thank you. Merci beaucoup, Philomena. Thank you very much, Philomena. I'll now ask Louis-Georges to uh, take the point on damages. 
or compensation? Well, thank you very much for your question. For me, education is part of compensation. Education is a right that everyone has. But if people were to be taught about the history of Africa or other continents, then through teaching that history and the colonial times and post-colonial times, you can also lead to compensation. It's part and parcel of compensation. What we've tried to do is talk to those in charge of education in France. In France, curricula are more about the Quran, Talmud and Bible lumped together. They don't try and teach anything of use. Uh, and we've, we've also tried to talk to editors of school books. Uh, there's about five or six uh, editors that produce 80% of the school books, and we've had a bit more success with them. We've suggested to them that they talk to scientists and uh, people working in academia to revise their content. And we said, look, this is advice. You take it on board or you leave it as it is. So this fairly liberal approach was fairly successful because we simply uh, told the publishers, the publishing houses, well, why don't uh, we teach France in the 19th and 18th century, but you're missing out 60% of what happened in France. And they said, well, no, we haven't. We've touched upon all of the topics. And I said, well, no, you haven't, because you don't mention the colonies. They said, well, the colonies are not part of the curriculum. I said, well, that's a pity, but it is part of history's past. Uh, and it's part of France. Now, uh, of course, at the time, it was a minority. No problem with minorities. But, uh, you know, if you want to talk about French history, you need to talk about everything. Now, of course, these publishing houses were uh, a bit embarrassed. They said, well, maybe we do need to revisit matters. We can't call it uh, colonialism because it's not part of the curriculum, but we can call it the history of France. So they took on board scientific facts and evidence that we produced for them, and in their new books they integrated that information. Now, of course, the program, the curriculum didn't change, but we did manage to work a number of these issues into the school books. Now, of course, they, talk, they don't talk about compensation as such, but it's leading up to that. Uh, Virginie. Uh Thank you. Virginie, I myself have a question as well about uh, media responsibility. Accès au poste, je suis, je suis d'accord, il n'y a pas que les... Well, yes. It's not just about having access to posts where you are in charge, the top level uh, posts. It's a collective effort and everyone, of course, uh, needs to take up that responsibility. Well, I'll now give the floor to Jean-Jacob to round up. Thank you. Well, we've just had an exchange of views. And I think it points quite clearly to the political dimension this issue has. Of course, there are legal and historical issues too, but it is also eminently political in nature. Now, the lady that spoke earlier underscored the political aspect. Because at the end of the day, it's the citizens of Europe who elect politicians to their post. And you have the political parties which are present on the political landscape in Europe. And it's not just about being a part of these parties. Once you're elected to a post or you're a member of a party, you need to make sure that your party uh, puts out the message that you want them to put out a and that's what we're trying to do and that's certainly my fight here within the European Parliament you know what the consequences are of that for me I'll continue to fight for what I believe in but of course we need to be aware uh, of this we, we, c we can't think that there is some enlightened vanguard you know that's fighting the battle we all need to do this and uh, American Afro descendants have a long history uh, of fighting uh, and taking the struggle to others. We've only started on our pilgrimage. And what I would invite you to do is to make sure that we can have more and more people fighting this fight uh, so that we can move away from these ads that I've just seen. I must admit, there's a few that I've never seen. But 
That's terrible. It's violent. You cannot begin to imagine what kind of uh, impact this has on your children to have this spoon fed. What kind of man or woman are they going to be tomorrow if these are the messages they're receiving? You're basically denying through these adverts their capacity to be a man or a woman in our society and to answer the question it's true that in European society French society when racist insults are proffered or when racist jokes are told uh, it's true that it happens I mean we all go to the workplace occasionally you hear a, a racist joke but no one's been sacked as a result now the day that you start complaining that there was a racist joke you'll be accused of not having a sense of humor that's what people will say but now we will have to go to the courts say yes fine accuse me of not having a sense of humor but every time there is a racist joke or there is a racist insult we need to make it clear to those perpetrators that there are courts we are not the perpetrators of this, we're the victims. So we've run out of patience, we have no longer have a sense of humor, and we go to the courts. Je vais uh, laisser conclure. Uh... I'll now let our moderator, the director of ENA, Michael Privot, make some concluding remarks, and then we'll move on to the next panel. Thank you. Jean Jacob, what can I say after that? That's a tough act to follow. All I can say is that Ena will take on board uh, the uh, conclusions of this panel. I think we need to try and get the European institutions on board and make sure that there can be social inclusion for non-Europeans and people of Afro descent. That's something to work on for the coming years. Thank you very much for your contributions. And I'll now invite to the top table Pascal, who will be the moderator for the next session. Unfortunately, we do not have time for a break. <laughs> so, excusez-moi, est-ce que vous pouvez m'entendre? Take a deep breath. Vous m'entendez? Because it's time for the second panel. So, I'd like to invite um, Rokaya. And the others to take a seat. Thank you so much. And I'm getting a glass of water. Uh, <clears throat> I hope you'll find. Uh, we know it's going to be very dense because we're going to continue until 6.30 without uh, breaks, but uh, coffee and, and tea might come back again. So um, take a deep breath and keep your hopes up. Uh, <laughs> 
My name is Pascal Hildebert. I'm uh, the director of the INAR Foundation. Uh, the INAR Foundation was created by INAR to develop projects and activities and resources for and with the anti-racist movement. Um, if you want to know more about us, um, later after uh, this hearing at, uh, from 6.37, we will welcome you uh, in uh, a drink with a drink um, offered uh, by, by uh, the Greens, and, uh, but in a room very close. Um, and if you want to know about us, there are a lot of things we're doing, in particular the Diva Perro, and you have some information in your uh, information pack. But uh, enough uh, publicity about what we're doing, even if I cannot resist doing that. All right. Um, after this extremely rich discussion, um, really amazing to hear so many different um, issues, what we wanted to do now is to move to a, another uh, dimension, which is to reflect on the challenges faced on the ground. What is going on? What, are, what is happening on the ground? In particular, what is ha happening on the ground? And how do artists, media, NGOs, um, deal with these issues. So we've invited a few people. Um, you know some of them. Um, I will ask them some questions. We'll make it a bit different from the first panel. We'll have some discussions. Um, but we will also ask them concretely to share what they do, what they would like to do, what they do, projects and activities. In a few words, you might know uh, Rokaya, she's a, a famous, very famous journalist uh, in France, but she's also known uh, worldwide for uh, her books and um, uh, worldwide, right? Yeah, yeah sure. Uh, sure. Um, <laughs> for her books and for her uh, TV shows. Um, and she's also, and very humbly, uh, on the board of INAR, so we're very proud of that too. Um, uh, Jalo, you've already met uh, before, and uh, he's going to talk uh, from uh, more his perspective as a chair of an NGO. Quincy, hi Quincy, welcome. Uh, he is um, a very interesting activist. Uh, he's a poet, and uh, I, uh, maybe he will have time to give us an idea of what he's doing. And in particular, talking about this famous Zwarte Piet, um, you might have heard about this story. It went to the UN, so congratulations. And let's see how it's going to change, uh, what you're doing to make uh, the change on the ground. Chokri Benchika is also here with us. Thank you so much. Another uh, interesting artist, activist, uh, author, singer, actor, what don't you do? Um, he's going to also give us some perspectives on, on uh, using a very interesting, very, um, con very interesting concept of a project called the Human Zoo. So we're going to talk about that also. But the first question I'd like to ask them to get them in the mood is to ask them about, for them, what is going on the, in the, on the ground? What are the problems that are faced by people, black people, uh, people of African descent and black Europeans? What are the problems on the ground that need to be dealt with? Maybe we start with Rokaya. I think this is your mic. I think oh, the lady right. has okay. been switching okay. off this one. Okay. okay. Bonjour, à, bonjour à tous. Good afternoon, one and all. I hope you can all hear me. Well, let me start off by thanking all of you for attending the event. It's great to see such a, a good response to this issue, an issue which is otherwise pretty much invisible. Now, when talking about the challenges that we come up against on the ground, then I think the main problem is denial. I think that's a problem. You know, whenever we take a position, people try and say, well, it's not true. Now, if I talk about my own country, France, then r racism is uh, an issue which is taboo, and it's not just racism against black people, against uh, all kinds of uh, ethnicities. And we have this republican uh, feeling in France where they're either French or you're not, but they, they don't take account of minorities at all, linguistic minorities, religious minorities, racial minorities. And when we talk about race, then they look at the biological side of things now, I think we all agree that from a biological point of view, there is no difference in race. It's just a human race, and that's it. And racism, in social terms, of course, uh, leads to artificial differences, and that's very dangerous. And that's a problem that we have in France, because it means that we can't properly comprehend the problems related to racism. And uh, 
it's an issue of cement semantics. Now we've called today's event Afrophobia, but uh, in France we say black, the English word, we don't say noir. Uh, for example, so it's a very complicated issue. Even verbalizing uh, the existence of people is a problem in France. So you can imagine w what kind of related problems there are further down the line. Now, what Virginie Sassoon was talking about earlier is interesting as well. There's a, a total absence of statistical data. That's another problem. We have uh, informal or unofficial information, but no clear statistical data. Now I think France is the country in Europe w with the most uh, black people living in it, also the country with the most Jews uh, and uh, Muslims living in it, so we, we have large minorities but we have no data whatsoever to put pressure on our politicians and that's a problem. What would you, what would you, what, what would you say uh, would be the problems on the ground? Thank you Pascal. Um, of course apart from um, what Rukaya mentioned earlier on uh, d data collection, there's no disaggregated data system that makes it possible for us to uh, visualize some of this problem, make them visible, some of the problems that we face. I think one of the issues that I find extremely urgent uh, to address is um, the kind of hate crimes that black people face uh, on a daily basis. And it's about justice. It's not about, it's not a moral issue. It's not about if I like black people or not, but it's about basic justice, that if somebody is victimized, there are laws uh, that would, be, would come into play and make sure that the perpetrators of such certain crimes would be bringing, uh, brought to justice. In Sweden, for example, um, in September, a young man with his son went for a walk to the playground. It was a normal day. The son is 18 months old, unprovoked a gang of 10 people, attacked this guy. They called him the N-word. They used all derogatory language against him. They beat him up, they abused him until he lost consciousness. He was standing on a bridge in front of his son. His son was screaming Papa the whole time and nobody cared, 10 people in a neighborhood where people were standing and watching this guy brutalized. And they wanted to throw him down a bridge which is four meter tall. This happened in Sweden. And this happened in September. 10 perpetrators, none of them, none of them is arrested until today, none of them. If you look around, you see pictures of the guy. You see pictures of the guy um, on the screen. There you go. That's him, Yusufa Salah. This is a reality for black people. And it's about justice, because if you have 10 people brutalize an innocent person, especially in front of his son, and nothing is done, the police are not doing what they're supposed to do, the politicians who are there are not going out and saying, this something has to be done. What we're saying is that you can commit such crimes against black people, and nothing is going to happen. There wouldn't be any consequences. So I think hate crimes is one of the fundamental problems that we face uh, in Europe today, and it's in existence in every part of Europe, in Germany, in Sweden, in Austria, and all the European countries, you see how black people are brutalized physically and nothing with impunity, impunity every single time. It can either be the police or the law enforcement agencies that will perpetrate these crimes, or it can be normal racist people uh, that will uh, commit these crimes. But one thing they have in common is that all of them are free. All of them do this, they commit these crimes with impunity. So for me personally, I think that's a, um, one of the problems that we face as black people in Europe. Thank you very much, Dello. Quincy, from your perspective, so yes. <laughs> Sometimes it's important to, to talk about real situations and not only about the theory, right? Thank you. Quincy. Um, I think in the Netherlands we have a situation whereby um, colonial amnesia is used as, as an excuse to stay stagnant and also to refuse an understanding of where our colonial past has brought us to right now. Um, for instance, in the year of 150 years of commemoration of the abolition of slavery, the Netherlands decided to defund its only institution that researched slavery. Um, in a, a, a year afterward, or actually in the same year, I should say, in 2013, a politician decided to introduce a law which was the same exact law and language which was used after the abolition of slavery for keeping people from the Afro-Dutch Caribbean diaspora outside of Europe. He wants to reintroduce past laws 
in a certain sense, and wants to be able to deport people from Afro-Dutch Caribbean descent from the country, uh, the Bosman wet. Um, he also, a couple of weeks ago, decided that it should be okay to give people from the Afro-Caribbean diaspora a different colored passport. Well, you hear all of this stuff, and it's coming from one of the coalition partners of the current government and it's not being taken back. What the government actually wants to do, or what a couple of politicians actually want to do, is relax the ability of the lower parliament, or the lower house, to introduce laws without judges actually testing them beforehand. So they want to make it even more possible, more easy, to enact ethnic profiling, ethnic, uh, 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 yeah, cleansing in a certain sense of the Netherlands. Um, what we also see is the perpetuation of the colonial imaginary. So what I'm talking about is the way how, for instance, when we talk about the, the period of time that the Netherlands became almighty, we still call it the golden age, while forgetting that that same century was a century in which they colonized Indonesia, they colonized most of the world, um, they were the, the, the innovators of the slave trade, and then afterwards decided, you know what, we're going to just do it our, our own way. So when we talk about um, the Netherlands, we talk about colonial imaginary not being understood and perpetuated year after year in the figure of Swarte Piet, where black servitude is once again brought up and given to children literally as sweets as they eat them, and also in books, children's books, and also to companies who perpetuate it because it's one of the single most profitable times of the year. So there is this disconnect between ethnic, um, not ethnic, but ethical social responsibility and profits in the Netherlands. So um, th those were a couple of points. And of course, I mean, the Netherlands, which used to be a guide country for all things tolerant and accepting of difference, has the last couple of years been slapped on the wrist a couple of times by Amnesty International, the European Council, and also our national ombudsman, which said that the political tide in the, the country was racist, flat out. Very interesting. Thank you. Chukri, tell us about your perspective. Yeah. Uh, this one or this one? This the, one? The, the one to your left, and okay. I'm going to switch on this one. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, merci uh, de, de, de m'avoir invité. Well, thank you for inviting me. I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank INA, the organization, and uh, the people that have decided to invite me along. I'm very happy to be here. But because this is part of my trajectory in a way. My name is Shokri Benshika. I was born in the Flemish side of Belgium. I was born in Ostend. Apologies for my French. It's not going to be brilliant, but I'll do my best. I'm of uh, Tunisian origin, but I was born in Ostend, as I said. So I'm a Flemish, Tunisian, Belgian. Now in Flanders, well, in Belgium, you, you know that we have a, a problem with our past. I'm doing a, a doctorate on that. I'm carrying out research into that. I'm looking at how Belgium and the Flemish within Belgium deal with their past and what their take on the past is. But above all, I'm an artist. And that's why I'm very interested by this. Trois choses, c'est en fait l'aspect. Now, of course, if you look at racism, then there's the issue of authority uh, of artists that tie in with that. Now. If you look at the end of the 19th century and the start of the 20th century uh, and the, these exhibitions that they had with people from a uh, different origin, then uh, that brought together that scientific side, the governments were involved in it, there was an, art, uh, an artistic side to it, and I, I think that's very interesting. 
when I started as an artist, I didn't take the uh, approach of Arab art, which is what people might assume, given uh, that I, I'm from North Africa. But I, I started from Senegal, really, uh, which people find odd, because, of course, Tunisia has its own culture and art. And Omar Kamara, uh, a Senegalese gentleman who studied in Dakar, uh, was my partner in crime, as it were. And he came to Europe. Uh, he had a, his own show and toured with that and then ended up in Belgium. And in Belgium, he tried to set up a troupe as well. And he kept telling me, well, we need a typically African troupe. Now, within the Bejar school, he'd received a contemporary education. But he kept going for typically African shows uh, and taking that slant. There was a, an African dance boom and music boom at the time in the 90s, because I'm talking about the 90s. And I went along with that. I had to survive as well. So I participated in that. Now, he always had uh, short-term contracts. And at some point, he received a, a letter saying that he was going to be expelled. But at the same time, he'd been in Europe for 10 years, setting up troops, uh, putting on shows, giving training. But he'd stayed within the African circuit, as it were, where all the stereotypes exist. Uh, and that's probably what led to his expulsion order. And he committed suicide. And that's something that triggered something in my mind. Uh, and I said, I live in a free, democratic country in Europe. Uh, and still we're being pushed in a certain direction. And that's when I started looking at history and tried understanding the mechanisms at place, uh, in, in place. And that's why I started looking at human bones. Thanks very much. Très troublante. Uh, yes, uh, that was most telling and uh, most fascinating. I think we're getting some uh, interesting ideas. Denial, statistics, hate crime, colonial amnesia, and colonial images. We're going to focus on Shokri. You're talking about your Human Bones project. Well, what exactly is it? We've heard about some of the background. Cook, can you tell us more about this? And perhaps we can ask others for other examples of similar projects. I beg your pardon, madam? Oui, pour rebondir sur ce qu'il a... Yes, I entirely agree with what you said. But there's, there's one important point that the gentleman made. If you're African, you tend to be steered in a certain direction. And uh, that's something one should not remain silent on. Quite so, yes, very, a point well made. Well, in Ghent, and we're, we're fortunate in Belgium because we've had a number of universal exhibitions, uh, fairs and such. And there, there were all sorts of exhibits, lot, lots of exotic exhibits, uh, including uh, Africans. In fact, African is number one in the sense because 200 Congolese were put on show. Now, I want to go back to Ghent. Uh, I was at university there. It's my hometown. Uh, at the 1913 World Exhibition there, World Fair, there were some interesting exhibits. We had the centenary of that last year to celebrate it. And of course, we, uh, what was celebrated was the industrial glory of Belgium. And together with scientists and activists and academics, we agreed we've got to commemorate other aspects. 160 Senegalese, or, uh, or 150, were put on show. And I, and I asked, what can we do about that? Go to the courts? I mean, people died during those exhibitions. 
they were clearly racist. There, there's academic agreement about that. And we wonder what we could do about that for the descendants of these people. I heard about compensation, redress, and stuff within the case of debate. And I'm, I'm reminded a lot of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in Africa. There wasn't a, a civil war here, but I did think a Truth Commission is a good idea. We could look at the truth of the facts, but there, there's, of course, there's subjective truth, and then we want to have uh, dialogue. I think there's a degree of healing that needs to be done with regard to the colonial past. Yes. Everybody in Flanders says, well, it's all King Leopold's fault, it's all the French speakers, but the Flanders also have that burden of responsibility. How do we s resolve this? Money? I created a commission or group. It, it was a show primarily, but uh, there were artists, academics from Ghent University. Uh, and I also got, uh, got uh, the provincial governor along because you need someone in a position of authority in this. And we drew up a set of conclusions. That's my project. We invited the artists from Senegal. I said that, that they were real descendants, so I sort of cheated. I'm an artist, I can do that kind of thing. Because I think it wouldn't have been ter terribly interesting or drawn attention if I had got people and I presented human bones, but the mayor of Ghent apologized on TV and, and we recorded that. But what's really important here is that a truth commission, even if it doesn't uh, come from the top top down, we don't want to get too in, involved with, pol with politicians. We shouldn't expect those in authority to do things. We've got to take justice for ourselves. Let's not hang around until there are truth committees because uh, we'll be kept waiting a long time if we do. Il me semble que certains d'entre vous. It would. I think uh, that some people uh, don't feel that their attendance is required. Uh, naming no names. Now we're going to move on to the question of the role of politicians in due course, but uh, we've got uh, we've got an interesting take on that. Parce que le maire <laughs> No. The governor participated, the mayor didn't participate. But, well, I think that's the way we'd all understood it, says the moderator, Quincy. Uh, about your project, Zwarte Piet, very famous. He looks like a lovely guy, this little Zwarte Piet. <laughs> I, I'm French, so I personally didn't know him until I moved to Belgium. So it was a very interesting concept. Tell us what you've been doing uh, around this issue in the Netherlands. Um, well, with Zwarte to Piet, what I decided to do, well, let me start off. For me, it all started when my mom was called Zwarte to Piet. And um, my mom, uh, at that time, 56 years old, a gray-haired lady, um, elegant as I don't know what, and all of a sudden a colleague decides to call her Zwarte to Piet. So I was like, hey, something that needs to be done. And what happened, which I found out afterwards, is that what happened to her um, was personal but wasn't unique. Because it happens to a lot of women, a lot of people around that period when they're called Black Pete's, right to Pete. Um, so in May of 2011, something interesting happened in the Netherlands. Geert Wilders was acquitted of hate speech. Um, uh, the, the freedom of speech was put up there as this unassailable right, fundamental right that everyone, you know, whatever they say, hate speech goes before anything. So I was like, okay, you know, freedom of speech, everyone can make use of it. So what I decided to do at one of my performances is make a t-shirt which says, right to Pete, is racism, and perform a poem on it. Um, during 
the months, the summer of 2011, what happened is I went to a lot of different fairs, different festivals, I met a lot of different people. Uh, I met Lulu Helder, Scotty Gravenberg. They wrote a book in 1998 called uh, Sinterklaas, Je Komen Binnen Zonder Knecht. Sinterklaas, Come On In Without Your Servant. I met uh, Beryl Biekman, who's been doing work on this for the last 30 years. Um, I met Roy Risti, who started his own grassroots commemoration of the abolition of slavery on the 30th of June and not the 1st of July, because he was like, the 1st of July, we were given freedom. The 30th of June, we fought for freedom. So I was like, hey, these are really interesting people that I could learn a lot from. So um, on the set, no, in, in, in November, the 12th of November 2011, I decided to go to the National Parade um, wearing one of these t-shirts. And what you guys need to know is that every year in the Netherlands we have a parade where Joie de Piet shows up. And it's not just one, it's about 500 of them. And people donned in blackface, red lipstick, black wigs, page suits, and they just go out into the street throwing sweets and just enjoying themselves. As they're making uh, uh, sounds, uh, they're jumping around being athletic, fools, and um, childlike appearances, and also speaking bad Dutch, grammatically bad Dutch. The figure came into existence in 1851, which was 12 years, or at least, let me say, visual uh, uh, agreement of how we should look like in 1851, 12 years before the abolition of slavery by the Netherlands, 1863. In the Netherlands, we had a 20-year discussion of what to do with our enslaved Africans. Um, I stress the word enslaved Africans and not slaves because nobody is born a slave, they're made into one. And I think that's what the relationship of Zwarte Piet to the Netherlands is also interesting, is that people were made into Zwarte Piet. Because the, uh, the figure is not based on the actual migration of people from the Surinamese colonies, from the, Afro, uh, from the Caribbean colonies to the Netherlands, because those were affluent Afro-Dutch people. So they spoke good Dutch, they looked well-dressed, they didn't have these suits on, they weren't servants for anybody. So this image is based on this time capsule. During a national parade, I decided to wear the shirt, and I had with me a researcher from Denmark, Siri Venning, and a journalist from the Netherlands, and both of them wanted to understand the experience of Zwarte Piet by black Dutch people. So they came along with me and, and a fan of the project, um, and Steffi Weber, who's a journalist. We went there, and we got arrested for having the T-shirt on. Um, free speech, free speech yeah. in the country of free speech. Yeah. Um, I was dragged uh, over the ground by uh, five, well, I, I remember it as five police officers. I got pepper sprayed and we, put in, we were put into a cell for uh, six and a half hours. Um, up until three months afterwards, I still couldn't raise my arms to what I could beforehand. Um, luckily enough for us, there was somebody there who filmed the arrest, and she put it on Facebook, and it was picked up by one of the most racist, misogynist, um, homophobic blogs of the country called No Class. Now, this blog afterwards decided to hound me as well. Um, what happened is that assertiveness by a new generation of um, children of migrants who grew up in the Netherlands, who were born in the Netherlands, kind of frightened the status quo and the establishment. So what you get is that one of the biggest media companies in the country had a coordinated effort to um, hassle me. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> At least you laugh about it. Well, what, 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 what interested me in that whole ordeal is that um, me and a t-shirt were seen were as dangerous to what was going on. So what you see is that what I actually did during that summer was activate others and tell others how they themselves could have the conversation. What happens in the Netherlands, or what was happening beforehand, is that from October until December, you would have these conversations about Black Pete, sorry to Pete, but not in June, <laughs> not in July, not in August, not in September. So people would be seeing me with a shirt and either think I was crazy, or think I was making an ironic joke, or be like, wait, 
I've been saying this for years. What, um, what are the tools that I can, you know, take on board myself and have the conversation with? I was lucky enough last year to be invited um, to a, a, a uh, workshop also coordinated by Einar, and I met a couple of ladies from Belgium who were also doing it. They're sitting there in the front row. And they were like, hey, here in Belgium, the conversation about it is also stagnant. What can we do? And that's, that's the point of my whole project. Um, what I also did everywhere I went is ju I just stood there. I didn't say a word. And the first thing that would happen is you'd get these angry people come up and start shouting at you, screaming, telling you to go back where you came from, saying you didn't you weren't born here, you don't understand it. And I would just stand there and just watch them. And they'd get frightened because I was way too calm. And um, then they'd calm down and they'd be like, hey, the, fact that you were, the facts you were telling me are not the right facts. So what I've done since then is I've gone also into media production. There is a, a radio station, a local Amsterdam radio station called Mart Radio. They've existed for the last 30 years on their own. It's a volunteer network. And what they've done is they've made sure that the voice of afro Surinamese, Afro-Caribbean people in Amsterdam wasn't silenced. Now, what happens is that in the Netherlands, um, around election time, minorities, migrants are sought. And we're going to take up your cause, vote for us, get us in there, we'll fight for you. When time rolls around to do something, it's called clientelisme saying, you know, we're, we're not here for only your wants and needs. We're for everyone's. And then you start to question, isn't racism and tackling racism something that we all should be doing? Um, one last point is that what I've, do, what I've done since going by Mark Radio is start a radio, uh, radio program called Routen et Eten, um, in English translation, Spanner in the Works, for the translator. And um, what you... What we have on the radio station is conversations on topics that range from biodiversity to politics to AIDS to whatever, to make sure that some kind of how we have these intellectually deep enriching conversations that aren't seen on public television. Last year, what happened, last, last point, is that um, uh, a TV program, the most watched TV program in the country, made a mistake, in a certain sense, of inviting me on there. <laughs> <laughs> and um, the country pretty much got an anxiety attack up until today um, on Zwarte Piet and Black Piet. Um, what a lot of people also didn't know at that time is that in, on the 1st of October 2012, um, the High Commissioner from the UN for Human Rights came to the Netherlands to... Um, inaugurate the new College of Mensenrechten, where uh, Professor Esther is also a member of, uh, advisor role, and we gave her a document about Zwarte Piet. It's all your fault, then. It's, it's, well, in connection with a lot of people who've been helping me on along the, the way and who've also said, this is my fight as well. It's okay. a front line that everyone is up against. Very interesting. Thank you so much. Jalo. Thank you. It's on, yeah? Okay. Oh. I normally say racism is about power, as um, uh, Philomena S. Professor S. Had said. And um, black people, our history has always been told by other people that are in power position and not us. Uh, and I think um, a very good place to start is to start telling our own stories, our own, our own history and our own uh, realities. So I will tell you, um, just like you did, I will tell you a story um, that took place in Sweden, uh, because I live in Sweden, so I can give you an example. Um, uh, you can see the picture on the screen. Uh, in 2011, one of the biggest universities in Sweden, had a, um, students had a party. And at this party, they had a jungle team. And the students came. Some of them were, you know, they, they painted themselves black, and they had shackles around their necks and arms, and they were supposed to be representing enslaved Africans. And they had another white student that took them in as the owner or the slave owner. Uh, and in the middle of the party, they decided to have a slave auction, okay? And I mean an auction. And they had these students that painted themselves on top of a table, and the other white students decided to bid and to buy these students. Now, uh, anybody in, in their right minds will understand that's not a joke, it's not funny. Uh, so when I got to know about this information, I wasn't there, it was a, an American student who was also a white student 
that realize that this is, you know, coming from the United States, for her, this is not okay. So she uh, asked one of the, um, the bouncers that were outside the guards and said, wait a minute, did you see what's happening in there? Is that okay? And the, the, the security said, no, don't worry about it. It's not a problem. Um, and she went just to confirm and ask one of the person that painted themselves, what are you supposed to represent? And the person used the N-word and said, I am the N-word. Uh, and these are white people who painted themselves black. Now, when I got to know about this information the same night, I filed a complaint the next morning. Uh, and when I filed a complaint, all hell broke loose because a lot of people got mad and angry and said, you as a black man, living in Sweden, which is a white man's country, cannot dictate how our university or how our students can behave or should behave. This is a tradition that we have, and you don't, it's not your place to tell us how to change our traditions. Now, um, it, it, media took over, and they published um, um, the complaint that I made, and it became um, a, a big thing in Sweden. Everybody talked about it. Now, for me personally, it became like a lynching um, time for me because um, people started calling my cell phone, people started sending emails, people started going to my Facebook, people started, you know, really threatening, like, we'll kill you and uh, we'll kill your family, we'll rape you and your family, we'll do this and that. And every time they refer to me, they, of course, they use the N-word, and they refer to my family, they use the N-word. Now, what happened the same week, somebody decided that, okay, it's not enough just threatening him and his family, I'm going to make a picture of him and put it around, around the city so that everybody can see what he is. And this is a picture that he took my face and he photoshopped it on um, uh, enslaved Africans. And he wrote a name, um, it is in Swedish, it says, uh, our nigger slave, is, this is a runaway nigger slave. And his name is Jalo Momodu, and if you should find him, please call this number. And this guy put this picture all around the city where I live and um, the city where the university is. Now, I filed a complaint, of course, because some of the students, I work at a university, some of the students that saw the picture at the university called me and sent me the picture, said, this is a picture of you, but not really you, so maybe you should be aware of it. So I saw it, and I filed a complaint directly to the police. And first of all, the police did not even want to take my complaint because they said, why are you complaining about this? You know, um, we, if you file a complaint, we're going to drop it anyway because we don't know who the perpetrator of this crime is, so, and we have more important things to do. Um, so I had to be en engaged in a, in, a, in, a, in a debate with this police officer on the phone over half an hour before he agreed because I said, I want to speak to, you, to, your, to the head of your department. And see, he went, he spoke to the head of the department, came back and said, okay. Now he took my complaint and we went to court. We found this guy because he, he happily said, I did this and I don't think this is any problem because he is uh, the N-word. That's not a problem. That's what it is. That's what he is. Um, we went to court. Now when we went to court, the guy that did this, he came with a T-shirt with a black face in it, and it says, you know, um, um, like, easily offended nigger. That's the text of what it says, and a black face. And he went to court with that black, with that T-shirt. Now, nobody said anything. Uh, not the judge, nobody, that's, not, not even the prosecutor who was representing me said anything. And every time he was, when he was referring to me, when he was uh, giving a testimony, he referred to me as the N-word in front of the court, in front of the judge. And nobody said, wait a minute, you cannot use this language here. Not even the prosecutor that represents me. Now, they asked him, now that you know some of the problems that you've caused for this guy and his family, if you knew this before you committed the crime, would you have done it? And he smiled and he said, yes, I would do it again. When the, when the uh, judge came to the final conclusion, he wrote that he found this guy guilty and they gave him a suspended sentence, but they will not send him to jail. And the reason is because, and this was written down, and the, the reason was because the judge do not, does not have any reason to believe that this guy is going to commit the same crime again. Even though he said in court in front of everybody, I'll do it again. Now, if you see the next picture here, this is his next work. To, show, to prove that he's got power over me as a white person in, 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 in a country where black people don't have any power. Again, justice. He did this even though the judge said, I don't believe he's going to do it. This is his next work. He put it in the city, a picture of me. And the second guy you see there is the guy that I showed picture first when I spoke the first time that he was, that was beaten up uh, by 10 people. And he, as you see, had nooses around our necks um, on the bridge. And that bridge you see on top, that's the bridge that this guy was uh, about to be thrown down on. And he put this around the city to show I have power, I can, I can violate you, I can denigrate you, I can treat you exactly as I want, and I know there wouldn't be any consequences. 
And that's what racism is about. Mm. It's about power. And of course, we have a campaign about Afrophobia. We're fighting against Afrophobia. The civil society, we're fighting against Afrophobia. And these pictures, I make sure that the whole world know about what is going on. And that's one way of, because we have to make it visible, because there's no statistics or uh, ways and means that you can collect data to make these things visible. So we have to, in civil society, we have to mobilize ourselves and make these this realities visible so the rest of the world can know this is real. Hmm. Now, what we did was, we went to the United States. We, have, we were invited to the, to the United States. First, the OSCE invited us where we showed the first, I showed the first, first picture to the delegates of the OSC, 50, about 51 or 57 member states. I talked about the situation in Sweden. We were invited to the United States. We went to the Congress. We talked about the situation in Sweden. And this is advocacy work. When, when I was speaking in, Sweden, in, in, in the Congress in the United States, the Swedish M ambassador, the representative from the Swedish embassy was there. Now, before I spoke, he had already received a copy of my speech. And of course, you, you know what he, he would say. He, he didn't like some of the things that I was about to say. Mm. So and I, he came to me and he, and he said, hello. I said, hi. And he said, I read your speech. You are not about to say things, nice things about my country. And uh, we are very um, careful with regards to our reputation in the United States. Then I said, I know. And that is why you're supposed to make sure that you rep have remedy for these, some of these problems that black people are facing. Now, what happened was we were invited directly by the Swedish embassy. We had a talk. And that talk was also translated back, communicated back to the government in Sweden. And as soon as we came back from the United States, we were invited by the Swedish government. And they say, we're going to do this as a result of the advocacy work that people have been doing all this time. Now, the Swedish government decided for the first time in history, first time in history to commission a report on Afrophobia, where they want to know exactly some of the problems that black people are facing in Sweden and have it as fact and so that they'll be able to have policies that would remedy some of the problems that black people are facing. And that is, for me, is, is, a, is, a, is a great accomplishment after hard, you know, really, really, really long struggle and fighting. And finally, I just wanted to say, uh, this second picture, as I said, I filed a complaint because we need to do this, we need to speak out. Mm -hmm. I filed a complaint again, and I'm going to court in a couple of weeks with the same guy. Now, when you have a suspended sentence, it says that if you commit a crime again, you go to jail. Mm -hmm. Now, the question is, if he's going to go to jail or the judge is going to say, I don't think he's going to commit it a tough time again. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you General. <laughs> Thank you very much, Jello. Um, we have a few more minutes. Uh, Rokaya, tell us about your initiative. Alors, je vais, je vais essayer d'être uh, rapide. I'll try to be brief and talk about two initiatives in France. It's been said that uh, people don't really use uh, racist language in the United States, or at least if they did, they get into trouble. But uh, in France, this kind of thing happens. Jean-Paul Guerlain, Guerlain being a famous luxury brand in France, they make perfumes, and uh, made certain statements on TV that um, for, to manufacture perfume, he had worked like a nigger, word used by the speaker. Of course, that was an expression that was current in the times of colonialism. And he, what was worse, he added, I'm not at all sure that any that niggers actually do work. So he, he tacked on what, he, what uh, she thought was a little joke. The trouble is nowadays, uh, there are social networks, so uh, it spread very quickly. And so very quickly, uh, demonstrations were organized in front of the girl and shops, particularly in the ones in the champs uh, Elysee. So a spontaneous movement uh, arose thanks to Facebook. This was back in 2010. So a sort of flash mob in front of Guerlain. It was completely non-violent, but it was very difficult to get into the shop because there was a very large number of people with uh, placards. This demonstration lasted uh, eight weeks. So a number of people who weren't usually active uh, were involved, but so did other organizations, such as Crom. And Guerlain's... Uh, company uh, knew 
that uh, the the Champs Elysees shop uh, had a huge turnover, and it was the run up to Christmas. So they agreed to meet uh, this uh, dem uh, these demonstrators, and the group quickly said that, that uh, Mr. Guerlain's uh, consultant contract was uh, going to be terminated. So that was a victory, and this ties in with what Jello said, and. What was v very helpful that Afro-Americans got involved. Two Afro-Americans came along to ask what's going on how can and said, how can people go around saying this kind of thing in public service television? And uh, so this is a case of uh, where mobilization worked. I'll give you another example from last year. Uh, it, a Spanish uh, group, uh, Mango, decided uh, to promote a set of jewelry called slave style that was the name of of uh, the brand uh, according to the mango website and uh, somebody tweeted this and asked do you think this is all right and uh, so uh, we launched an organization in changeput.org uh, i know a couple of uh, top-ranking actors in uh, France, they agreed uh, to sign the petition, and uh, this spread. Mango claimed there was a translation error. Uh, apparently, there was a translation error from uh, Spanish and French. They're terribly sorry, but uh, uh, they changed the name for the collars. But we asked for more. We wanted them to get rid of the collar. It didn't just say slave style, but it was in fact a, a, a replica of a slave collar uh, with a, the kind of plaque that would have had uh, the slave's owner's names on it. And we said that this wasn't stylish in any way and that it was uh, negating and indeed mocking an appalling historical phenomenon that uh, affected millions of Africans. Com organized uh, further demonstrations and uh, organized a, a slave march, as it were, by a manga shop. So people who were chained up walked around a uh, mongo shop. And so to just to illustrate, this isn't a piece of jewelry. This is about people being chained. And whence the uh, collar was sold, that manga decided not to sell it anymore in France. Now, this same collar wasn't called slave style collar on the US website. So obviously, manga was aware of what they were doing, but uh, they, they just did not care about what uh, European Africans or Afro descendant thought. In Italy, it had the same name and it bore the same name, slave collar, in Spain. This shows the extent to which uh, viral protests, the social networks, can create a bad buzz for the brand. So, digital mobilization is helpful and that can lead to a proper struggle against uh, these corporations and so we can e even though we may be small in size we can use the tools available to us uh, to fight against this big organization there's uh, Kiabi mark they sell uh, party costumes quite often of course as we've heard from Jalu uh, th this is supposed to be uh, fun dressing up, but it's racism. They had a costume called Zulu. They took uh, pictures of white actors dressed up with this. Uh, it was very colorful. They had uh, bones through their hair, bones all over. And uh, they've been taken on by these social networks. These aren't people that are not militants by and large, and they changed this. In the description of the of the costume, it says there's there's prehistoric costumes, but even nowadays we've got something very similar. Zulu costumes. 
Kiabi uh, changed its mind thanks to what happened via the social media. So that's something that can be helped. Use the social media as part of the solution. Julie a très généreusement donné 10 minutes. Well, Julie's given us 10 extra minutes, uh, which is uh, very generous of her. But I have a direct question for all of you uh, in relation to the solutions that you would like to see in place. But before doing that, I'll take two questions from the room and then we'll continue. Yes, the lady in blue and then the girl just down here. Yes, go ahead. Uh, merci beaucoup um, pour uh, cette uh, uh, conférence. Thank you very much, and thank you for the event, the conference. I think it's very important. Of course, we shouldn't let people abuse others with impunity. But I have more of a political question, and maybe you can answer that for me. How about the rise of right-wing parties? They want to return immigrants to their countries of origin. You have Marie Le Pen in France, for example. Uh, Vilmers, uh, he's uh, voted in in the Netherlands. Hungary would be another example. But you have a referendum now also against immigration, not p in particular against Africans, also against Europeans, in a country which isn't part of the EU, but a neighboring country, of course. Uh, and my question is, how do you explain these events and developments from your point of view uh, of being uh, either uh, of African descent or immigrants? Um, oui. voilà. Mon nom est Sonia Toro. I'm Sonia Toro. I work here in Brussels for the office, uh, the representative office of Volvo, a Swedish uh, company, and I'm also part of an initiative that comes from the diaspora, that's the EU Africa Chambers of Commerce. And I'm part of the initiative because it brings together experts from the diaspora. So they look for young professionals and we form an expert network and the idea is that we render the expertise that we hold visible. And the question I have is pretty straightforward. Can these types of initiatives be seen as a way of changing mentalities by improving the profile and by giving more profile to the experience that we have from the diaspora or uh, as Africans? Because we talk a lot about cultural initiatives, but that might stigmatize the African community to some extent. Now, of course, we're at a crossroads in economic terms. And maybe these types of initiatives might also bear fruit. But I just wanted to know from you whether you think uh, the same way. Please. Or not commentaire, plutôt. Uh, je suis Mamadou. I'm Mamadou. I come from Greece. I'm a political refugee in Greece. Uh, and that I also have an application underway here in Belgium. My question is for the Member of Parliament. Now, Greece, of course, is a member of the European Union. But there is flagrant racism in Greece. It's rampant against immigrants. And those who are, are, are lucky or unlucky, I'm not sure what it is, to have a darker skin uh, struggle. And the government is complicit in this racism, as are uh, the police force and other forces, and these immigrants uh, are deprived of their rights. They can't go to work anymore. They can't leave the country. 
they're trapped, there's no assistance in place at all. They're, they're hit and attacked in the streets. And those immigrants are now being harassed by those people who should be protecting them and helping them. Now, Greece, of course, has the presidency currently, and maybe that's something that we should raise. Now, there's a great deal of condemnation about what is happening there, and you hear that from various outfits and organizations. But maybe as they have the presidency of the council at the moment, it's time to speak up. Greece has the presidency, and maybe we should impose sanctions. We vociferously condemn what is happening there and what they are doing, but after that, there are no actions. They're in the presidency of the council, and nobody seems to care. So maybe uh, the member of parliament can tell us whether something's been done or whether something can be done. So that's my question to the MEP. Have you tried to do anything here in Parliament? And maybe we should start looking at what is happening in democratic countries and maybe we need a, a, a green number but if there's a problem uh, with an African in countries they're putting phone numbers in place to repress that and uh, a further development that I've been informed about by uh, our militants in Greece is that in January there was a Syrian lady that arrived in Greece in Belgium seeking protection she is the oldest refugee that I know I think she's a hundred and seven year years old she's called Sabrina I talked to her by phone for three or four minutes but she arrived in Greece and we looked at what we could do for her because she was treated appallingly and she said that it was better to stay in homes and die under the bombing than to come to Greece and that's a lady who's 107 years old telling me that and that was a phone call that we had. Si vous voulez bien, le débat suivant, le, le panel suivant sera sur la... Well, the next panel will be to look at how we can react in political terms, what can be done at local, national and EU level. So that question I'll leave for the next panel. But I'll come back to the question about how we can use uh, economics as a best practice. If Yes, uh, I, think, I think it's a very good initiative, um, fantastic initiative. We have to do everything that we can to empower black people. Um, and, um, you know, um, talking about economic independence is, is extremely important in this struggle. Uh, but then at the same time, as I encourage that, it's, it's very important that we are aware of the fact that the reason why black people are excluded is not because they lack this potential and this, this intelligence and all these merits and uh, the, the competence. A lot of black people have it. In Sweden, we normally say we have the most educated cab drivers. It's not because they don't speak the language or they don't, they don't have the qualifications, but because the society do not acknowledge of their qualifications and, and, and their competence. So that, that's where the problem is. There's a structural problem that uh, limits the possibility for people like us to come into uh, the system. And that's where we need to uh, work and try to break those structures so that we can come into the system. You can recruit as many um, um, 
intellectuals and, and entrepreneurs as possible, if the structures are closed, they wouldn't have a possibility to come in. So structural racism, I think that's where we need to uh, put a lot of effort on. Thank Thanks. you very much, Hello. I would like to ask each of you very briefly just a question about what, according to your expertise and your experience, you would like the politicians to talk, take on board. Um, very quick. Uh, Yes. Um, when I, when, uh, no, français. Uh, when I talked about the Truth Commission, uh, I was When I talked about the Truth Commission, I was suggesting that we set up Truth Commissions because at the bicentenary in Ghent, we tried that, but we should do it in all cities where there have been these exhibitions and so on. But not just to deal with the past but also to deal with the present. I, for example, in the work that I produced, the work of art, I also looked at how to integrate matters. I mean, at political level, you have initiatives and committees, but we need to I improve the integration. And also in my research, I found this, and also in the shows, I found this, there's a lot of racism in the method that you use for integrating matters and that then perpetuates the past and the colonial thinking. So I think you can point to that continuity in the Truth Commission and it's when you point it out to them that it becomes clear to them. So these Truth Commissions need to be present in hospitals, in schools, in all kinds of organizations. For example, we did it in the old uh, Palace of Justice in Ghent, and that's where we created a Truth Commission. But I think this should be replicated across Europe. Because my fear is that each community will go it alone, but all of these minorities should work together. We're all human bones, and in human bones it's not just about uh, black persons. We, we have people from the Philippines that are represented, uh, from North Africa as well, and we should all fight against discrimination. We shouldn't be in our community, in our ivory tower, and go it alone, because, you know, united we stand stronger than divided. Ah, merci. Merci. <laughs> j'ai réussi, j'ai réussi. Il fallait pas respirer, il fallait pas respirer. Quincy, can you prefer than uh, Shukri? <laughs> um, I think the Netherlands has um, an, a problem. Our political parties at the moment are in disarray. So they don't quite know what to do with a changing social, economic, political landscape in Europe and in the country itself. So on the one hand, you need to be able to get people into the political process who will tackle um, segregated school systems, who will tackle housing, who will tackle um, education as, uh, assessment. But at the same time, we have to acknowledge the fact that on local council level right now, the political parties are whitening their party lists. So the people who can be elected into the local councils are going to be mostly white. And that's, for example, for a city like Amsterdam, where more than 50% of the population is of migrant or uh, um, background. So something's going on there. Okay. Um, what I think we need to have, what I think we need to have is um, a second wave of actions beyond indignation. Apologies are not enough anymore. Um, in the Netherlands right now, we have, for example, years and years and years of research of, of discrimination within the ranks of the police. We have discrimination um, by temp agencies. And what happens is we love self-regulation. So the industries themselves, we let them go at it. And then they end up with some half-hearted, let's send everyone to our cultural sensitivity workshop. Uh, the perpetrators in the Netherlands need to consent to their own punishment. That's never going to happen. <laughs> so we need to have police and politicians actually enact the laws that we have already on the books. Thank basically, you. Yeah. thank you. Very good. Thank you.
Jello, with your expertise, yeah. I'm sure you can say one sentence. Exactly. That's what I was planning to do. Um, um, I, think, I think if you look at the Roma strategy, it started by seeking recognition. I think black people or people of African descent and black Europeans, we don't have that recognition. That's why it needs to start. So for me, um, what I would advise politicians to do is to start using Afrophobia in your documents, in the language that you use in your day-to-day -day, day -day work. Because in that sense, you recognize that this is a problem in the societies and communities we live in. But if you acknowledge of all the other types of racism and discrimination, and you don't mention the specific type that affect black people, then we are not going to go forward. So my advice is, please, we need that form of official and institutional recognition. And secondly, just quickly, uh, we have a document here that I think you can have access to that INA has, which is the, uh, the EU framework um, for inclusion of people of African descent. And there you'll see all the different uh, uh, points that we think are important to lift at uh, international level, EU level, but also at national level. We want the politicians at EU level, but also at national level, to make sure that they adopt this EU framework, because it would be, for us, a possibility to be able to uh, acknowledge that this is a problem, but also come up with solutions or suggestions to solutions to the problems that we face. Thank, Thank you. Thanks. And Rokaya, you can beat them. <laughs> no, me. Uh, I think I've not talked very long. It seems like I'm... I don't think I spoke at length. I'm the only woman on the panel, so I'm not going to sacrifice any of my speaking time. I, I, I'm sorry. But I, I hope I won't speak at length. I agree entirely with Jalo when he says that racism is an issue of power and privilege. And I do think that that's something we need to bear in mind. They're not going to want to stop racism out of some feeling of charity. That's never going to happen. That's a pipe dream. It's not in the other people's interests. So we'll have to fight them. And I agree, therefore, with previous speakers uh, about what happens to people who have racist slurs, they lose their jobs. And I mean, if you can't take legal proceedings or legal decision because it didn't go to court, then you can try and make sure that there are social implications to what they've done. You can hit them I in their reputation, their economic interests, and that what might then stop them from using racist language, and that then gives us that leverage. But of course, you know, we need to make a nuisance of ourselves as it were, you know, we have a vote, we have social media, uh, that can reverberate very strongly in our populations. So I do think we have a lot of options open to us to make sure that we are heard and that we change the balance of power and try and beat them. But we're not going to win by simply saying, well, it's okay, I understand. No. We shouldn't accept any of it, and we need to systematically speak out against it. And we also need solidar solidarity networks. You have a lot of organizations that are represented here today, but that work in a very isolated manner. I mean, I've learned a lot about things, initiatives in other uh, countries, and it's a pity that I didn't hear about it earlier. And ENAR is a good start, but I do think we need to make sure that we, we, we have our networks and that we can help each other. I would like to thank you all very much. Thank you so much for your contributions. Cathy, I apologize. Uh, and I don't know how you're going to make it, but uh, I just delegate the problem to the other panel. Um, the other questions will be dealt with with this panel. Thank you very much. Mm, take a little brief, bre a moment to breathe, but sitting, and then we move to the next panel. Thank you so much. We Jin? Jin?
Excusez-moi, s'il vous plaît. S'il vous plaît. Excuse me. Un petit peu de silence. Could we have some hush, please, because we're going to continue immediately so that we can finish on time. Pourquoi on m'entend pas okay. Alors, Henri, bah c'est qui t'a les oreilles bouchées Oui. Henri, ouais. Ok. Allez, ah. Là. Henri, il doit partir à 18h. Ok, mais c'est lui qui, doit, qui va commencer. Ok. Bon, euh, voilà. Allô, allô. Ça marche pas, ça marche. S'il vous plaît. Ça y est, tout le monde est là. Bon, alors on passe au troisième. Right, then I suggest we move on to the third panel. On va y arriver. Hein. S'il vous plaît, s'il vous plaît, s'il vous plaît. <rire> voilà. Alors, avant de commencer. Now, before we get started, could I thank uh, all of the interpreters? for keeping up. It's not straightforward for them. There's a lot of read out speeches which weren't made available to them and we do speak quite quickly so that's not easy on them. But anyway, we don't have a great deal of time left. So, Jabbar is here. You, you managed to make it. There's also some people from Paris here, someone from Toulouse, someone from Marseille. Hello to you. Thank you to one and all for turning up. This is a, a first, the fact that we meet here in the European Parliament, and I think we should all uh, realize that we started in October. I'd like to thank uh, my member of Parliament, who's to my left, for organizing this, and I'd also like to thank Enar and Julie. Now, I've thanked everyone I needed to thank, so we can get down to the heart of the matter. Now, we've heard a lot up until now uh, about people who've been treated very badly, all very painful experiences. The, there's a, an anti-black racist tendency here in Europe, and now we can't just denounce these issues, take note of them, try and justify them. We need to move on to action. In France, a minister was insulted. Uh, in Sweden, we can't continue to accept that other Afro-descendants get beaten up. That uh, is no longer acceptable. Enough is enough, and that's why we have Mr. Henry Nichols here. He's to my right. He's a researcher, is that it? <laughs> ah, pardon, excuse-moi, pardon, pardon. No, no, pardon, c'est Monsieur Peter Bosman, excusez-moi. Alors, Monsieur... No, sorry, it's Peter Bosman. He's born in Ghana, but he's a Slovene politician. He arrived in Slovenia in the 80s to study medicine. He's a member of the Social Democrat Party in Slovenia. He campaigned in 2010 for the municipal uh, elections in, in Piran, the southeast of Slovenia, and he won against the incumbent. So he's now the mayor of Piran. We'll give the floor to Mr. Peter Bosman first because he'll have to leave. Okay. Okay. Uh, donc, en fait, il va uh, surtout s'intéresser à l'action. And he'll be tell telling us about what action can be taken at the local level. Good evening. Good evening, and thank you very much for inviting me to this conference, which I think is a very important conference. Um, and as Catherine said, this morning, uh, this afternoon, at the beginning, we've heard of uh, tribulations. But in the end, it's not that bad, you know? You know why? Because we've got a chance to make a change. And it's, this third part should talk about hope to talk about action. And the fact that three politicians are sitting here, three politicians of African descent, two politicians of African descent, shows that there has been some change. Polit politicians can make a difference. And there are two things that people understand in this world right now. 
is political power and economic power. These are the things that matter right now in this world. There's no moral power. There's nothing about moralizing. And that's why it's very important that we get together. Every single vote counts. And never forget that, because it's unfortunate. But all statistics show that most uh, immigrants who have the right to vote don't go to the polling station because they think they can't make a change, they can't make a difference. And that's wrong. You could make a difference. You should get together, you should vote for people who you know will stand up for you. You should vote for uh, 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 politicians of African descent who are going to also run for, 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 for posts and who will represent your cause. You know, last year I was at a conference here and uh, a member of parliament, a right-wing member of parliament had the audacity to bring, uh, to talk about some statistics about immigrants here. You know, statistics can be used in any way. If I tell you that in my community, 50% of all Africans have been uh, in elected positions you say, wow, what is happening in that country? But there are only two of us. <laughs> that is statistics. So if somebody tells you that most of crimes that, have been, that are taking place in this town are by immigrants, ask him to explain the statistics because it's probably playing with numbers. What I'm talking about is that you have to have a pride. You have to know that you are worth something. Don't play the game of the racists. Because by every time you play the game of the racists, then you're giving them more power in their hands. Locally, what can you do? Get engaged. Get engaged in the community. Learn the language. It's important. Learn the language. Make yourself needed. And never be afraid to say that you're of African descent. Never be afraid of that. Integration doesn't mean losing your identity. It means losing a bit of your independence, but not your identity. And it's important always to keep your identity. You should form clubs, but don't segregate yourselves. And let the local authorities help you in getting uh, your clubs or your, your societies to show the differences between the majority and yourselves. Don't be afraid to do that. Because in differences, when people see the differences, they get to appreciate their own culture. People are afraid, you know, of change. But if you say, well, I come from Africa, or I come from, I don't know where else, or Afghanistan, or wherever. I do this a little differently. I think a little differently. It also empowers the person who sees you to think about his own culture. I think one of the biggest mistakes we do is that we go into groups and we, we lecture only to ourselves. We don't lecture to people outside. Don't be afraid to tell of where you came from, of who you are, and why you came to Europe. Political, economic, or just by chance. I came to Europe 30 years ago, nearly 30 years ago, as a political refugee. I stayed in Europe by choice because that was my fate. I planned to go back home and uh, the first time I wanted to go back home, my wife who is Slovenian became pregnant. We decided to stay another couple of years. And then when I decided after two or three years to go back home, she became pregnant again. <laughs> and I, started, I decided to stay again another two or three years. And by that time, I'd, I was working as a doctor and I was referred to as the black doctor, the African doctor. After six years' work in my community, they didn't call me the black doctor anymore. They said I was going to my doctor. 
My point is that each and every one of us has to work in the community and never forget who you are. I am, because uh, <laughs> the answers are in our hands. I think this afternoon, this afternoon, many times the panel has told you, has talked about how we have to take things into our own hands. Racism will not stop because of some politician in, uh, in parliament. Racism will only stop if we decide, it, we, we decide that we want it to stop. And I think the professor, as said, made a very, very fine distinction between the American experience and the European experience. And that is the difference. And that is the essential difference. That is why I'm calling upon you get together every single vote counts and then you can say as I always say when I give these talks I am African by by birth I am Slovenian by choice and I believe in Europe thank you Thanks. Thanks, thank you Alors, maintenant je vais now, how much do we have? Well, well, we'll crack on. We'll give the floor now to Mr. Makengo. Was he was born in Kinshasa? So he's from the Congo. At age fourteen, his family moved to Luz. He's a member of the Socialist Party and became, uh, or was elected, deputy major, two thousand eight, the first black man to hold the post in that city. He is member of the Council for Midi Pyrenees and is in charge of uh, diversity in Toulouse and is part of the Cities Again uh, for Diversity Network. He's going to talk to us about initiatives at different levels, European, national, and local. So, over to you, Mr. McKengo. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank the organizers for having thought of uh, your humble servant. I'm uh, chairman of the Cities Against uh, Racism Network, so we welcome this initiative, and I'd like to thank Jean Jacob for this invitation. And uh, this gives me an opportunity to talk about something which is uh, dear to my heart. Uh, and it's something which I believe to be of crucial importance for the future of Europe. The black question, let me call it that way. Now, at a European level, what can be done? First of all, we need to acknowledge black people as European citizens. We're not talking about Europeans who date back to the times of Athens, but they're Europeans that have European citizenship, just as you, you could be a Belgian citizen or French European and be a European citizen, and they're all Europeans here will have that European passport, be they black or not. But we also need to change our understanding of Afro-descendants because a lot of what happens is down to perspectives on Africa and Afro-descendants. That applies to ourselves and elsewhere. Uh, Afro-descendants can be singers, actors, uh, or smokers of ganja, or they can be uh, little Ethiopians or little black, or, you know, N word people uh, in Somalia or, or dictators. People always have this kind of prejudice about people. It's this kind of perception. And there's a perception of people that black people come to Europe uh, to benefit uh, from what's available, be it democracy or anything else. Once we've accepted that, we need to start accepting Afro-descendants with their specificities and uh, cultural heritage. I'm Congolese by origin. I love Congolese food. That doesn't mean that in France I uh, don't act as a Frenchman. I'm, I'm not obliged, on the other hand, to be to uh, 
eat everything the French people have uh, or to eat. Uh, I'm a French citizen with my own specificities. Now, at a national level, things get a bit more complicated. At a European level, you can keep it a bit more general and uh, make uh, broad statements. What can we do at a national level, on the other hand? Uh, if you think about uh, how this is tackled in France, and we've heard about this already, it's very difficult to talk about these things. We're, uh, I've been avoid crime, and you realize that uh, if you start talking about this, is that you want to get a wise. It's a way of shutting down the debate. If you start saying Afro-descended people suffer discrimination because of the condition people say well you're just trying to divide society into communities and we'll get it uh, you want to um, you want a special treatment do you that's the question you ask you get asked well to to address discrimination you've got to call it by its name I like saying to my socialist colleagues and after all Politicians uh, like uh, trotting out prints about this. Yes, discrimination. Well, give time to time, they say. Well, take the example of women. There are very few women in the French National Assembly, 30%. Well, how do you know there's 30%? Well, you go there and you count them up. But, but you can't say how many black people are in the parliament because that's illegal. Well, that clearly shows there's a problem. If we were to address these issues, we need to call them by name, we need to measure them, and then call things as they are. I like to, 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 to em em emphasize the fact that I am the first elected black representative in Toulouse. Uh, finally, in 2008, people realized it was time to elect someone black. There are 100 and 69 different national nationalities in the world, and we have uh, them well represented in Toulouse. And if you don't start talking about these things, you can't address them politically. Thereafter, uh, I, I like this idea of Afrophobia, I have to say, as a concept, because you've got to draw distinctions and, as I say, call things by their name. We have the fight against discrimination, against racism, Uh, people will say, well, anti-Semitism is a particular case. Islamophobia is also a specific case. Well, I would argue that negrophobia, Afrophobia is also a specific phenomenon. Louis-Georges is from the West Indies. I come from Africa. What, what do, do we have in common? That's because our children are more likely to be stopped on the street by the police because they're black, not because they're French and descendants and... Uh, of Moliere. They're stigmatized. Equally, people are stigmatized because they've got a long beard and they're deemed to be Muslims. People are stigmatized uh, because they wear a kippah and so they're deemed to be Jews. So, negrophobia is part of discrimination, a type of discrimination. Then uh, we've been asked what view should we elected representatives take uh, on extreme right-wing parties? Well, I'm in favor of banning them. Now I'm always told, well, look, freedom of expression, what about that? Well, they, they're allowed to enjoy freedom of expression. So you've got to start asking about the limits. I'm sorry, I don't like to see a political party funded by my taxes go on telly uh, uh, and uh, call me names I don't like that I think they should be banned pure and simple an extremist movement be it anti-black anti-white anti-whatever should be banned that's called having political courage Now, what, what a local level, what's my role? Well, there we can do a bit more. Mayors have the ability to put in place policies uh, without getting into foreigner, not foreigner. 
provided they have the will, of course. Now, I am in favour of citizenship of residents. You're from Toulouse, Paris, Marseille. If you, li if you live there and you are due the same services, that allows foreigners, be they black, white, or from the Maghreb or whatever, to be citizens, to feel citizens of their town or city. And that goes beyond the national logic, I think, and works better. And then we also need balanced policies at a local level. Yeah, you can get very intellectual arguments, because I've been quizzed about these things. Why are there more Africans or North Africans in certain areas? Well, I say, well, there's a revenue. And it starts getting so academic or highfalutin. Yeah, you know, it's perfectly straightforward. Uh, quite often people do some of this. If you want to do something about these things, you can in politics. Quite often people say we can't. It is possible if you want balanced policies on housing. You can do that at a local level, but again, Mayors, local elected representatives need to have the political will. Finally, I'd like to speak in more general terms. We shouldn't play the eternal victims. We've got to see that we've got a responsibility here. As elected representatives, I have noticed that Afro-descendant movements uh, are often more cultural in nature. They don't work with elected representatives. They don't have links to cities when they come to see us because they want a room for some event, which is uh, fantastic. But, but, but it weakens them at the end of the day because oh, when I talk to my fellow elected representative, is you say, well, look, you know, your people don't get involved in local politics discussions. And I say, yeah, yeah, we've got to find ways of doing that. So that's why we need to change mutual perceptions. There's not the bad white guys and the nice black people waiting for society to come and help them out. No, the change has to operate on both sides. And my colleague made this point extremely well. Then there's a question of your mental package. When you come to live in a country and you decide this is you're going to live there, you're not in transit. You've got to take an interest in, in the economic, cultural, political life and indeed the trade union life of the country. And the trouble is is that the, men, the mental baggage some people have is that they've come, but they're not really there. All they're doing is working uh, to get some money and go back home. But quite often they get underpaid jobs, so they're, nev they're never going to have enough money to go back home and be rich. They, 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 they prolong their stay. I'm finishing, so to speak. I know of people who've spent a longer time trying to go back home than they've been at home. There are people who I know who've got a home at, uh, at their own country, but not here in Europe, even though they arrived at Europe when they were 20 and they're 60 now. And these people have never got involved in, in the social, political life of their country. They're in transit. They basically had their suitcase at the ready by the door. We have responsibility to bear as an elected representative and black person, but I have to reach out to people explain things to try to integrate people and to try to get everybody on board. We don't really talk about the integration of people born in France, but everybody's got to do that, be they or West Indian or African in origin. They've got to find their place. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Uh, and I give the floor to Henri Nichols, who's uh, a researcher at the European Fundamental Rights Agency. He, he li works uh, in the Equality and Citizens' Rights section. He's head of Unit for Equality. Now, acknowledgement, recognition, important words. One of the first initiatives organized uh, by uh, the representative six months was to call for a written 
declaration acknowledging Europe's uh, colonial past and uh, slavery, involvement in slavery. But anyway, it, it's a welcome initiative, even if it hasn't borne fruit. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank the uh, organizers for inviting us on to this event. I'll cut my presentation uh, brief. Uh, I'll uh, speak uh, in English now. Uh, when considering the switch, na pedro facile. When considering how to act politically to counter phenomena of racism targeting persons of African descent and black Europeans, it is useful to be reminded of the legal framework underlying the issue. And this is what my presentation will focus on. But first, allow me very briefly to say what the Fundamental Rights Agency is and what it does. The role of the agency is to provide evidence-based advice and expertise to EU institutions and its member states. Specifically, the role of the agency is to support these institutions and states with regard to respecting fundamental rights fully when implementing EU law. But moving to the topic of today's hearing, the European Union and its member states have adopted a number of binding legal instruments to enable them to counter racism, xenophobia, related intolerance and discrimination. The most prominent among those are the Framework Decision on Racism, the so-called Racial Equality Directive, and the Employment Equality Directive. There are others, but I'll focus on these. It must be emphasized from the outset that the European Union rejects theories of the existence, theories that attempt to determine the existence of separate human races. So the term racial origin does not imply an acceptance of such theories, but sometimes you're stuck with a vocabulary that you don't want. We all know what that's, what, what, what that's like. In any event, the framework decision on racism aims to ensure that the same behavior constitutes an offense in all member states and that effective, proportionate, and dissuasive criminal penalties, including the possibility of imprisonment, are provided for natural and legal persons who have committed or are liable for offenses motivated by racism or xenophobia. The European Commission recently published a report on the implementation of the framework decision in the member states. It shows that the majority of member states have provisions in national law on incitement to racist and xenophobic violence and hatred, but these do not always seem to fully transpose the offenses covered by the framework decision. So the conclusion the, com the Commission came to is that member states should transpose this framework decision fully and correctly into national legislation. This would be a first step towards effectively combating racism and xenophobia by means of criminal law in a coherent manner across the EU. I was going to cut out this part, but I think I'm going to put it back in because on the back of the presentation by Virginie Sassoon this morning, the audio, me the audio visual media services directive also makes it so that racism cannot be there in the media. So there are also provisions about that. And coming back to the, to the cyber, cyber hate in the, in the, the cyber sphere, as it, uh, let's say, there is the additional protocol of the Council of Europe Convention on Cybercrime, which is specifically target, targeting racist speech. But to date, on, only a minority of EU member states uh, have ratified this protocol. So, but next to legislation countering racism, there is also legislation to promote equality and non-discrimination. So the, the Racial Equality Directive and the Employment Equality Directive generally are considered to have significantly raised the level of protection against discrimination across the European Union. This was the case because member states were required to view, review their, their legislation to comply with the directives. Very briefly, the Employment Equality Directive prohibits discrimination based on grounds of religion, belief, disability, age, and sexual orientation. The protection offered, however, is limited to the area of employment. The Racial Equality Directive protects against racial and ethnic discrimination in many areas other than employment. Taking, taken together, these directives form a well-developed anti-discrimination framework. But despite this framework, uh, and the resulting progress is that there was in many member states, evidence gathered by FRA and others showed that discrimination rem remains a part of the daily experience of many in Europe, which you're all familiar with. And despite discrimination persisting in our societies, the level of complaints remains very low, which is a problem in itself, because it raises the question of the practical effectiveness of the laws that were designed to implement the principles of equal treatment and to counter discrimination. I will cut this part because of time, but, <laughs> but the, the one of the main areas where discrimination is in evidence is in employment, as you, as, as you will know, but it's also very much there in uh, 
goods and services, for example, when people are trying to enter a cafe, a restaurant, a bar, or a nightclub. Excusez-moi, j'ai l'impression que le. I beg your pardon. Could you slow down a bit, please? Et ne suis pas. Ne suis pas parce non. que ma présentation, je dis les courtes et de trois cause. C'est pas grave. Non. I'd my presentation. The important aspect is also that is also in the directives is about awareness raising in the area of discrimination. And Friday evidence shows that most people are simply not aware of the rights that they have in that area. And this is this is this is a major problem in itself. And uh, one of the results is that very few people, very very few people, actually report any incidents that they are victims of, whether it's of discrimination or hate crime. Up to 80 percent of people not don't respond, don't do not report these incidents, which means that uh, Judge Allah was talking earlier about access to justice. How can you have access to justice if you don't even go and report that, uh, that an incident? And, um, but it's not only the lack of awareness that is leading people not to, respond, not to report uh, incidents. Three of the most common reasons that are mentioned and Fra, uh, that Fra has found is that people believe nothing would happen as a result of uh, reporting incidents, and that's, <laughs> or they don't know how to go about reporting incidents, or they feel that there's too much de 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 bureaucracy and it's just simply not worth the hassle, and these are serious problems that need to be addressed. So the question then becomes to know what can be done to address the situation. One thing is obviously awareness raising activities where national equality bodies have a specific role to play, as well as civil society organizations. But I'm very being telegraphic here, apologies. Um, also, one other thing that could be done is to extend the mandate of equality bodies to enable them to actually take a complaint forward without the person having to be involved. Because people don't necessarily Encore want to go in. petite minute. In petite minute? Bon. In, in one minute then. Uh, <laughs> the, this is more important than mine. The, the, no, well. I think the, the problems, everybody is aware of the problems, and today we talked about it quite extensively. But maybe then, just to, just to conclude, and um, um, despite the progress that has been made over the years in countering racism discrimination, it's very much still needs to be done, and particularly where so much is at stake. The EU has strong legislation to combat inequality and discrimination, but as Vivian Reding, the Commissioner for, for Justice, Fundamental Rights, and Citizenship said, Laws are only as good as the extent to which they are enforced and implemented in practice. And we need solid comparable data on equality as well as strong political commitment at every level to ensure this implementation is taking place. Only under these circumstances, uh, under these conditions, can it be assessed whether the laws we have are those that we need to move towards eliminating inequality throughout the European Union. I apologize for the telegraphic nature of the presentation, but uh, such is time. But uh, yeah, everything was said today, but Yeah, thank you. Merci en tout cas. Merci beaucoup. Well, I imagine we can find your speech on. I'll try and sort that out. A lot of this is in the uh, document on the implementation of the Equality Directive. There are a few copies here. If not, you can find it on the agency website and we'll make uh, the presentation available to you. Can we move on to questions? Well, I, I, I would, uh, I would uh, ask that we reply to the questions that have been asked. Now, there's a whole petition backing me up or this relates to the uh, refugees in Greece and they need our support. So uh, we'll let the MEP reply and then pro probably we'll have questions that are coming to us from Twitter. Uh, and uh, then we'll hear from Mr. Bicep and then possibly from the room. I'd like to uh, reply to the last two speakers. We're supposed to focus on politics in this panel. First of all, immigration. 
yes, there has been a rise in extreme right-wing parties in many countries in Europe. Yes, they talk about sending immigrants back, or at least some of them. Now, it is true to say, of course, that there are Afro-descendants that have lived that live in Africa. Some immigrant Afro-descendant immigrants are first wave immigrants, but equally, there are Afro-descendants who are Europeans who live at home. I mean, where are they going to send them back to? They're at home already. If you're French, you have a French ID card and a European passport. You're not an immigrant. You're a Frenchman or woman. You're an Afro-descendant, French citizen perhaps, or with roots elsewhere, possibly. And likewise for Spanish Afro-descendants and so forth. Our Swedish uh, colleague talked about that too. So parties that, are do, that talk about that are just engaging in tub-thumping. You know, you're going to go back several generations. Uh, and send back people who aren't uh, pure blood or uh, from the countries. I mean, how many million people would you have to send back? You'd have to send back uh, the Italians who, who moved to, to Italy uh, in the 50s, the Poles who arrived in France in the 40s and so forth. So there have been population movements all the time in Europe. So it's just thump-thumping, demagogy. So on immigration, allow me to point out to you that the biggest graveyard is the Mediterranean. The Mediterranean is a sea where every day people trying to come to Europe die. When all they're trying to do is find a better life for themselves. And whatever the, the extreme right uh, say, the solution is not going to be closing the borders. It'll never work. In the in the in the in the USA Mexico border, they've got electrified barriers, but people still manage to get through. What we need are cooperation policies between these countries in Europe. I mean, a lot of these countries are former colonies. We Europeans have indeed looted resources. We Europeans have prevented the development of these countries thanks to uh, trade policies that are deleterious to these countries. But uh, yes, I'm finishing. We've impoverished these countries, and today we we want to say to the children of these people, no, you can't come to Europe because we want to, to keep the cake for ourselves and you can't have any. No, it won't work. The only thing that will work is cooperation between the North, the developed countries, and the South. And all they want is their seat at the table. And so the gentlemen, yes, Greece, is uh, in the presidency at the EU because of the rotating system. And uh, I'd point out been, there's been a lot of protests about the way immigrants are being treated in Greece. Greece is suffering an unprecedented economic crisis. And in crises, people always find scapegoats. And who are the scapegoats? Foreigners. So the situation you're facing in Greece is uh, clearly in, in breach of your rights. But this cannot be explained away by the crisis or justified by the crisis. A country in crisis cannot use immigrants as a scapegoat. Uh, and the European Parliament has protested officially. I myself have signed the resolutions on the immigrant question in Greece, so I know about this. 
but uh, the way things are organized mean that for for these six months uh, Greece is in the presidency of the EU we're fully aware of this indeed so much so that we've had a debate as to whether the next meeting of the Afro-Caribbean Pacific countries should take place in Greece the Greeks refused to host the African delegations in Greece and so we're going to organize the meeting in Strasbourg in two weeks time so everyone knows what's going on nobody's unaware of what what's happening in Greece today Merci. On va prendre rapidement parce briefly because we have to leave at half past voilà. donc je fais vite je... so the twitter question for the MEP and Mr. Ernshay we have to take one for people who have been following us, uh, us on twitter people can be sacked for racism in the USA when's that going to be possible in Europe particularly at high levels or what can the European Commission do about this? Well, we, we've heard uh, the outline of an example of what happened. So we, and uh, equally, we've heard about uh, the legal toolbox available in Europe. Unfortunately, we can only take three questions because we need to conclude and we do need to hear from uh, Mrs. Jean Lambert and Mrs. Bicep. And uh, just for information, you should have received uh, this poster, that's the next initiative. You should all have a poster like this. You don't? Well, if you don't, you, there is some here at the door, and we'll take a group uh, photo of everybody holding the Stop Afrophobia post and put it on the social networks. Madam, name and organization. Good evening, my name is Leela. I represent the initiative MAG uh, shop. Uh, we're involved in entrepreneurship. I'd like to comment on what uh, Mr. McKengo said. He said that the mindset of our descendants needs to change. I think that's an important point. I think it's a point that's not been made sufficiently well. Others have a lot of responsibility to bear, but we too have our own and that, that that's about how we behave and sometimes we need to do something to address stereotypes and here, here can I reply to Mr. McKenga Pol you're in politics so are other Afro descendants what do you do to cooperate with uh, African politicians to do something about uh, stereotypes you mentioned for instance uh, dictators Mr. McKengo thank you madam for that question well it's fairly straightforward if you're in politics you need values that's what I think these can be or are for me equality and seeing to it that uh, others receive better treatment than they do in other cities in Europe or Africa. And that's for mindsets and the way in which people themselves manage to get their mindsets to move on. Well, what's most important in this debate is mutual respect. That's what's most important. Today, nobody queries white politicians uh, making certain mistakes. 
uh, I've heard people excusing themselves uh, for, for, for blunders on camera. People would say, well, Mr. McKenga, well, he had his chance and he's blown it. It's a lack of respect. Respect, that's the key. When you start respecting other people, when people people respect each other, the, the discussion will change. Thank you, Mr. McKenga. One last question. Applause, I think, is in order. Last question. Because I do want to give the floor to Mrs. Lambert, who's uh, honoured us with her presence uh, throughout the afternoon. So it's the very least uh, we can do, give us some speaking time. So, last question. The lady in the green jumper. It's not a question. My name's a, I'm a European citizen. I'll be very brief indeed. Can I just say yeah, that, that uh, I'm an Afro-descendant. Uh, I'm a Maghribian. I'm not black, though. But uh, my origins are in Africa. I want to say to people, don't get rolled over by an, a nascent uh, African oligarchy. I'm fed up with or, 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 of uh, people coming in from... Uh, Tunisia or Maghreb trying to represent me because I've, I'm, I'm second generation. Don't let that kind of thing happen because I've, there are certain things uh, which uh, will bother me, M Mr. McKengo. The lady's microphone gets cut off. On n'entend pas ça. Vos petits jeunes de quartier. Now, I don't think young people belong to us. They don't belong to anybody. Why do people go and see you talk about uh, young people in the different neighborhoods of the city? Black doesn't mean poor, sorry. And if you come from a more uh, modest working, working class area, there can be problems. I'll leave it at that. Yes, indeed. Says the mantra. Get, we're now going to the floor to Jean Lambert. Now, so the people don't get upset or frustrated. Uh, and that can happen when we discuss these matters. Can I remind you that there is to be a buffet? And that'll give us an opportunity to continue the debate. All right. Uh, we can do so uh, with a glass of wine and something to eat. But don't forget the photo. I'll leave it at that and give the floor to Mrs. Lambert. Okay, well, firstly, thank you very much for the, um, you know, for the, all the interventions this afternoon because I think that there's been a lot there to, to learn from. Um, certainly, I now have a, a very big shopping list of things that, uh, you, you know, if I'm re-elected, I have to do. If not, I have to make sure that others do it. Um, that I think that some of what's coming through for me are very much a message that's come from a lot of people and a big concern about what the new uh, European Parliament will look like next May. So first message is please, all of you who have the possibility of voting, please vote. Get all your friends, all your family, anybody that you bump into to get out there and vote and vote for you, you know something more progressive than some of the forces uh, that, that are out there that are extremely frightening because as we know every time and we've seen it in Greece for example a party like Golden Dawn is elected a lot of people then feel that they are legitimized in terms of the increase in hate speech, of discrimination, of attacks on the, on the street. I mean, we saw that in London many years ago when the first member of the British National Party was elected. Um, and, you know, we also know that the one way that um, you, you reduce their chance, well, there are several ways you reduce their chances, some are legal, um, but one is to use your vote and two is to organize. 
and to really uh, fight back. We've heard about a lot of the legislation that's there. I think it's a responsibility for all of us who have the, the power and the possibility to make sure that that legislation is properly put in place, is enforced, it's used, that victims are supported, that victims are believed, and that therefore we do need to challenge as well a lot of the authorities, whether that's the, the police, whether it's public prosecutors, um, whoever else it is, to actually do their job properly and to treat people you know, as equal before the law and not equal before the opinion of somebody who has the task of administering the law the justice must stand and some of what we've been hearing this afternoon I think it's horrific and a reminder to all of us that um, there is still a very strong job to be done that certainly I think one of the things that this Parliament needs to do is really to look much more seriously also at the relationships that it has with Africa and that it has with the Caribbean that I think that we really undervalue in this Parliament our relationships with Africa. And if you think of you know, the countries to which you know, there's a particular delegation as opposed to being the ACP, you, know, you have South Africa and that's about it. You know, Nigeria doesn't have a delegation. We, we really undervalue that. And therefore, I think you know, we also are not paying proper attention to, in terms of some of the reparation that's been talked about, um, you know, the role that we have in controlling our companies, in making sure that they actually deliver decent wages, decent working conditions, that the profits actually stay with the people that do the work rather than being taken out as they have been for so many um, centuries. I think that there's a real role of responsibility with the European level that we need to be taking on. And there's a whole long list of other things that you've raised that we're aware of, but I'm also aware people want to do their photo. They want to go out and talk to each other. You've done a lot of listening this afternoon. You know, it'd be nice to have a drink and talk. Um, so again, thank you very much for all those that have organized this afternoon. I think it's been, you know, a great learning experience and hopefully a great sharing experience. Thank you. Thank you. Well, before you leave the room, could I just give you a bit of information? First of all, there's the buffet. People outside are waiting to show us to the buffet. Secondly, Mr. Bicep and Mr. Philippe Lambert are going to have an exhibition. It will take place from the 6th to the 14th of March here in Parliament. That's the first once again. The information office in Place de Luxembourg will give you all of the relevant information. So from the 6th to the 14th of March there will be that exhibition. So these issues are going to be dealt with in the future as well. Now before giving Mr. Bisseps, the floor again. Let me thank Jean Lambert once again. Without her, we couldn't have organised this event. She's given her, us uh, her support as well. So thank you very much to her. Le, le mot de la fin, Monsieur le député. Now the closing remarks from the MEP, and then we'll have a group photo outside. Yes, I'll be very brief. Could I simply thank you for? taking the trouble to come here, uh, turning out in large numbers. Thank you to the interpreters for bearing with us. Not the easiest of event to interpret that. The speeches weren't given to them in advance, which is what we try to do. But thank you to Ina, thank you to Eka, thank you to Kran, thank you all for coming here and travelling here. And as I said, we, we're in this for the long haul and we're only at the start of our struggle. <laughs>